Hey, what's going on guys? Inky Johnson here. Welcome to another edition of Sudden Change. Man, I hope you, your family, your friends are doing well with all that's going on with the current uh, pandemic in this world, man. A lot of people are hurting. A lot of people are experiencing a level of life that they've never experienced uh, before, right? And a guy was asking me the question a few days ago, just my thoughts and my perspective about all that's going on. And I always think in terms of okay, life, what are you trying to teach me, right? What's the lesson in this, right? What can I extract from it to apply it to life down the line when we get through it and get past it? And I'll never forget, man, I'm reminded of a story about the 9-11 incident, right? That a lot of us know, um, terrible tragedy, right? Senseless act, a lot of people lost their lives, right? And I'll never forget during this time when it happened, I was reading an article, right? Because I was doing some research and in this article, it was talking about the other side, right? Of the situation, right? Like the situation was the sudden change, right? With people losing their lives, people getting hit with a level of adversity that they didn't ask for, that they didn't warrant. And we all know what happened and how it happened, but we couldn't measure like the experience of fear that people got. We couldn't measure what happened to people, right? When they were in the midst of, we couldn't measure that, right? But our hearts went out to them and the country pulled together and showed a level of unity like never before. But in this article that I was reading, it talked about a gentleman that got up that was going to that building that morning, but his wife stopped him and said, I need you to really take our daughter to kindergarten this morning, right? And the gentleman said, babe, I really have some meetings I need to be at, can you take her? And the wife was like, no, I really need you to do it. And he was like, babe, I got these meetings. And the wife was like, can you please take her to kindergarten? And the gentleman said, sure, I'll do it. As a result, it spared his life. One gentleman was on the New Jersey Turnpike. Accident happened. Talked about his frustration. He was mad. Accident happened, right? He wanted to get to work. Who wouldn't? But because the accident happened, the sudden check, it spared his life. One gentleman, they sent him to go get some donuts. He's going to the donut shop. Gentleman bumps into him, spills some coffee on his shirt, has to go home and change his shirt. Because he had to go home and change his shirt, he was in that same building. It spared his life. One gentleman got a new pair of shoes, right? Walking to work, gets a blister on his foot, goes back home to change his shoes, but was heading to that same building. As a result, it spared his life. The other side. Right? When opposition and adversity, most importantly, when sudden change happens, there's always things in life that we can go back and track certain moments and say, man, when this happened or when that happened or when I experienced that, I'm extremely grateful for it. Not always in the moment. Right? I heard a guy say something the other day, man, and it was so beautiful. Right? He said when things happen and situations happen in life, it kind of works like a seesaw. Right? You experience the pain. You experience the uncertainty. Right, you experience the fear, and sometimes you experience tears, right? But it gets to a point in time in life to where that thing seesaws, right? And when you think about that experience, you'll smile before you cry, right? The other side of it, right? The other side of sudden change. And so my task for you is this. Let's focus on the other side of this situation. Let's focus on the other side and see what we can extract from this situation. Let's focus on the other side and see what we're grateful for with this situation and all of the things that we're experiencing. Take care, be safe, peace. All right, everybody, welcome in to part 15. Really level panel, um, really excited to get back at it this week and uh, kind of change the pace a little bit. We do kind of focused on the college game, figured we'd uh, switch it up a little bit and uh, give a glimpse of the pro game. Um, obviously, you know, everyone's excited about the NBA starting back. So I uh, figured we kind of go a little different route and give uh, the pro game. So we got three really good, good ones on here to, uh, to share with us tonight. Just a couple ground rules real quick. Uh, how we do things is uh, each, 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 uh, Guests will share uh, their journey. They'll share some nuggets they want to share. And then we'll open up for questions. And then we'll move on to uh, each su successive uh, next panelist. So we'll do that. Um, when you have questions, uh, please introduce yourself, name, and, and whatever affiliation you are with. And, and please, um, you know, for, for the sake of everyone on here, 
try not to tell a story when you ask a question. Um, just simply ask your question, and then um, you know the the coach will do the best job they can to to answer that. So uh, we're really grateful. So without uh, further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first up tonight, we've got Jordan Surencamp from uh, head video coordinator with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, I've gotten the pleasure of kind of getting to know Jordan a little bit through this quarantine um, through, uh, through Russ Willemson. So thank you, Russ, for kind of putting me in touch with Jordan and uh, really excited for Jordan to share, um, you know, kind of his journey uh, to, to where he's at now with the Charlotte Hornets. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jordan. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to get on the call tonight. Um, wherever you are in the country, it's nine o'clock where I'm at here in Charlotte. So pushing my bedtime. So uh, ask all the questions you want. Keep me awake. I appreciate it. No, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, head video coordinator for the Charlotte Hornets currently. I uh, was born and raised in a small town in Indianapolis. Uh, Indiana played Division Three basketball. Uh, four years at a school there, just side, uh, outside of Indianapolis. Um, and during my four years there is really when I began to kind of develop my, my interest in what I wanted to do uh, after graduating. And initially, it didn't really have anything to do with coaching. It was more of um, the basketball side of like the business aspect of it, whether it was a front office, different things like that. Um, but as my, my career came to an end and I realized that the professional world was not uh, in terms of playing was not something that I would have a lot of options for. Um, my passion kind of drew towards being able to stay involved with the game and coaching kind of took over from there. Um, during my time at Wabash, uh, where I played, uh, spent a lot of summers just doing various internships with different businesses and things like that. But one thing I always did was I made time every summer towards basketball camps. And initially, um, I started out at Butler University, working camps for Coach Stevens at the time. Uh, he played at DePaul University, which um, is the rival school, rival D3 school that uh, I played at. So we had a little bit of a connection there. Uh, but during my four years, I really just started working those camps initially just to, to kind of make money on the side and um, get to know the staff, get to know the players, and really just gave me a place to work out too um, during the day. So uh, initially it started like that. And then as my college career um, came to a close and, and I, I graduated, it, it became more of a um, potential opportunities for me. So uh, when I graduated, my initial plan and, and the thing I had in mind was I was going to try and be a grad assistant at Butler, right? Work for Coach Stevens, work for his staff and, and kind of stay home in Indianapolis close to where I lived. Uh, that same year that I graduated was the same year that he took the Celtics job. So um, Butler hired a new coach, um, brought in some different staffers and they decided to go a different way with their graduate assistantship. But uh, I was lucky enough that in my time, um, over four years developing relationships with that staff that uh, one of Coach Stevens' assistants, Matthew Graves, uh, was also getting his first head coaching opportunity at the University of South Alabama. And um, Coach Graves uh, knew I had an interest in continuing my coaching career or starting my co coaching career, if you will. Um, so he offered me the opportunity to be a grad assistant. So I picked up a couple months after I graduated, moved uh, to Mobile, Alabama, had never been south of basically Tennessee in my entire life. So um, spent, ended up spending four years down there. Um, as, as coach mentioned earlier, got to meet um, great people there. The staff was incredible. Um, Russ Williamson being one of those guys who's on the call tonight. Uh, Russ and I are still very close. We talk almost every day. Um, and he really took me under his wing my first couple of years there and uh, really helped me to kind of create um, the types of habits that I still have today that have allowed me to, to kind of make my jump. So spent two years as a grad assistant under Coach Graves and staff there. And then after two years of being a grad assistant, uh, they liked me enough that they wanted to keep me around. So I spent two years as a director of operations. Uh, after that second year of director of operations, uh, the opportunity was presented to me to move to the professional level. Um, and ironically enough, it was through another Butler connection. So while I was playing, I developed a really good relationship with Ronald Norad, who's currently on our staff here in Charlotte. Um, Ron and I played basically the same years. And, uh, you know, our relationship was both basketball involved and outside of basketball. Um, spent a lot of time together and stuff like that. But at the time, uh, Ron had taken the, the head coaching job with the Long Island Nets, which was the Brooklyn Nets G League affiliate. And um, the, the video coordinating position for that uh, organization opened up. Ron reached out. 
him and I had talked back and forth about my interest in uh, potentially um, testing the professional ranks um, and, and seeing if there were opportunities there. Uh, so lucky enough, I was able to send my resume, uh, flew out to uh, Summer League that year in Vegas and interviewed for the position, was lucky enough to um, have the opportunity to work within the Brooklyn Nets organization and for the Long Island Nets. I was there for one year um, and it was one of the biggest um, learning curves and jumps in my entire life. They really threw me into the fire. Um, my time as a grad assistant and ops guy, I did a lot of video work, but it was never to the extent um, to what is required at, at, at the professional level. Uh, so just the attention to detail, um, just the different ways that, that you have to manufacture film and, and just the way uh, basic workflows go even are, are entirely different. So uh, it was really a, an eye-opening and, and great experience. I was the only video coordinator for our entire staff. So I did all of our video work um, in terms of cutting games at night, building edits, um, uh, capturing games live, doing all that type of stuff. So um, really good one year there in the Brooklyn Nets organization in general is just a first class organization. So I'm um, extremely thankful for the opportunity to be there for a year uh, with Sean Marks, Kenny, all those guys in, in Brooklyn, uh, Trevor Henry, who was the head video guy there as well, really um, helped me out. So um, having one really good year there was great. Uh, I fully intended on actually going back into that position potentially. Um, but Ron Norred uh, actually took an opportunity with the Charlotte Hornets as a front bench assistant. And um, lucky enough, while he was going through that transition, an assistant video coordinating position opened up in Charlotte. He reached out to me again. Um, and I was, again, lucky enough to be able to have the opportunity to go to Charlotte and interview for the position. Uh, it worked out well. Um, and it was, it was something um, that I felt was a right move for me. Uh, being able to get into an NBA video room from the G League. Um, and again, that transition itself was another big jump for me um, just because of the, the, the difference in games played, um, just the amount of detail that the coaches go into at that level. Um, and, and still to this day, I'm, I'm still learning every single day. So uh, again, wanted to thank Coach Bentley again for um, having us on here um, and doing this kind of stuff. But um, again, after, after my one year, uh, as the video coordinator, assistant video coordinator in Charlotte. Um, our head video coordinator last year, my boss, Quentin Crawford, who's now with the LA Lakers, uh, moved on and the coaching staff uh, developed enough of a, repu or a, a relationship and enough respect, I guess, for me uh, and my work that they offered me the, the head video coordinating position um, just a year after being in the video room. So again, another jump from G League to NBA to now running a video room with, with six other guys in it was another big jump. Um, and, and that's where I'm currently at, obviously with the pandemic and everything, it's been a really interesting year. I've learned a lot, been thrown in the fire a lot, which I really, really enjoy. Um, just being uncomfortable, uh, just trying to, uh, make myself better every day, absorb as much as I can. Uh, coach Brego, who's our head coach and that entire staff in Charlotte are top notch, um, really brilliant basketball minds, to be honest with you. So. Um, just really thankful to be able to work alongside of them every day, be in coaches meetings, um, be on the court doing player development stuff, and then just uh, continuing to grow my role. Um, that's one thing that, that's been really big to me over the last two years is just the um, expansion and personal development that they've allowed me to have personally in terms of developing my role um, and my responsibilities on a day to day basis. So uh, that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell, uh, quick elevator speech, I guess. Um, do you want me to go into my nuggets now, or are we going to transition, or how do you want to do this, Coach? Yeah, we'll go ahead and go into those, and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, cool. So, um, obviously, uh, been a lot of different places in the last couple of years, and, and I haven't stopped learning uh, in each place. So, there were numerous things that I could definitely teach on, uh, or not even teach, but just uh, kind of give advice on, just from – whether it was Brooklyn and Long Island or here in Charlotte or even back in South Alabama or even when I was playing in college. Uh, obviously, um, endless, endless nuggets. And I've worked uh, – I've been extremely grateful to be able to work for really, really good people everywhere I've been. And that's one of the biggest things that I believe in is as much time and, and dedication as it takes to be in the coaching world. And although all of you know the amount of time and, and commitment that it takes, uh, being surrounded by really good people – um, and people that believe in you and, and you guys can develop, uh, develop, you know, strong and close relationships uh, that last outside of a job or, or a position um, that that was, it's been huge for me, but 
Um, I decided on three that I take really seriously with my role here in Charlotte, but it's something that is um, transparent at every level of coaching. And I just call them, you know, the anticipation, embracing, and excelling. Those are the three different things that I wanted to touch on tonight. Um, and, and they're pretty straightforward, but the reality is, is, is those three things are, um, I think, extremely important in everybody's growth and development, um, and especially if you're continuing to look to move up the ladder um, and get to positions where Coach Pannone and, and Coach Hardy are now. You know, I'm, I'm still in that position where I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to get there. And um, they're very well respected coaches within the game of basketball in general, but also um, within the NBA and, and in European and, and international basketball. So I'm just as excited to hear them talk tonight as, as I am to be on here speaking as well. So uh, the first one with anticipation, um, I think is, is pretty self-explanatory in, in any sense, um, whether you're in the video room or you're an assistant coach, right? Being able to anticipate the needs of your head coach, the anticipate the needs of your players um, and all of, all of the things that come with that. And then myself personally, as a video guy, the technology issues, right? like the computers crashing, these types of things, the more you can anticipate, you can eliminate a lot of things and a lot of um, issues that may um, hinder other coaches' workflows or even um, hurt your players, right? So um, one of the things I do personally when I took over, um, not just as an assistant, but now as well as a head video coordinator is I've went through and I've basically memorized all of our coaches on staff's workflows. So I know how all of them operate um, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of when I hand them a scout game or a scout game's handed to them or one of our games is handed to them or they're looking at an edit, right? I can go through each one of our assistants and tell you how that assistant is going to go through and review that film. And from a head video coordinating position, I think that's huge because now I'm able to organize and structure and present it to them in a way that now they're not having to take the time to go through and reorganize or restructure and it allows them to focus on what's important to them in their role. And that's to get us prepared for our next game the next practice, the next player development worked out. So it may be, you know, Coach A just wants to watch a game uh, or a practice naturally, right, like from tip off to, to final horn. Uh, we have some coaches who like to watch based on action. You may watch all the mid pick and rolls. You may watch all the side pick and rolls, the different coverages, those types of things. Um, and then even talking with our head coach, you know, Coach Borrego, um, he, he really enjoys um, being able to process things as they would develop for instance, offensively. So he'd rather watch offensive uh, transition first and early offense than sets, then, um, you know, side out and underneath out and then end of game. So just having those types of, um, the different types of feels that your coaches have, um, from my standpoint in the video room really helps them out and I think saves them a lot of time. Um, besides anticipating, uh, the other thing that I've learned a lot, especially being in the, uh, the video room is embracing your role uh, and understanding you know exactly what that role is and doing that to the best of your ability. Um, being able to have a clear understanding of what your job is every single day allows you to do it better. So um, whether that's communicating with your head coach, communicating with your boss or whoever it may be, um, just making sure you guys are on the same page to whatever that role is, whatever your job is and embracing that. Uh, I feel like a lot of times now, there are a lot of people in a certain position that are so worried about getting to the next position that they forget to do the job that they're supposed to be doing right now well, right? So if your job is to do A, B, and C, and you're worried about doing D, E, and F, it's gonna be very hard for you to do A, B, and C really well. And that's something that I've learned um, throughout my entire career to this point, is focus on being in the moment and focus on doing your job to the best of your ability. Um, and that's where the excelling part comes is again, understanding your role and being able to excel, uh, in that role, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, building edits or doing player development stuff or handling a certain scout, whatever it may be being really good and excelling in your role, whether it's, uh, and that can be through de being detail or, uh, oriented. I, I, I pride myself on being extremely organized and structured and how I do things. Um, to make it easier for our staff. So a lot of uh, attention to detail, a lot of organization. Um, again, in my role as a head video coordinator, I work alongside our head coach almost constantly. So um, the availability, always being, always having my phone on, on, on uh, loud, even if I'm asleep, right? Uh, which I don't sleep much during the season anyway, so that's usually not a problem. But um, just being able to be available, um, having those details, uh, you know, nailed down, 
um, and just kind of pushing the gray area, you know, being really, really good at what you do, but also um, trying to make your role better. And what that does is it establishes trust within your staff. And I think that's one way I, I was blessed enough to have the opportunity to go from assistant video coordinator to head video coordinator is I think that my work ethic um, and my understanding of my role and my ability to try and excel in that role built enough trust within our staff that my role then began to expand. So instead of just helping with player development workouts, now I'm running them. Instead of just handing over scout information, now I'm helping write scouting reports. Now I'm helping build edits that we show the team, right? So being really, really good in your role, whatever that may be currently, helps build trust that then allows you to expand your role and continue to develop and grow uh, yourself personally. So just having that, that team emphasis, the team mindset, being a good teammate has been something I've always been taught. So uh, buying into the organization, your coaching staff, what they believe in, um, and just replicating that whenever you can and, and just doing whatever's best for the team and the organization. Awesome. That's some, that's really good stuff. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up uh, for questions. Obviously, like I said, just introduce yourself. You can either raise your hand or just jump on and, and unmute yourself and uh, name and where you're from and then ask your question. Don't everybody go at once. <laughs> Jordan, Patrick Moynihan, Appalachian State. Um, scouting reports, go through the difference because you have a lot more time to prepare at the college level, which you were there at South Al, and then the NBA being sure. they're still on top of each other. Sure. And how much detail do you actually get into them? Compare the two. Uh, well, pretty substantial detail, to be honest with you. And the, and the time frame – um, is not nearly as, as long as, like you said, with the college level. Sometimes you have four or five days at the college level to prepare. In NBA, it may be you play one game on a Tuesday and then you're playing the next night against another team, right? So uh, um, aside from the scouting report part of it, when it comes to preparing, I think at the professional level, you are uh, – teams are more drilled into how they're going to guard certain things, Right. And DHOs, we're doing it this way. And mid pick and rolls, we're doing it this way. Side pick and rolls, we're doing it this way. And then as we go game to game, those remain relatively consistent, right? But then you make tweaks based on personnel or based on ways that they may attack you offensively. So um, as opposed to the college level where you may not necessarily overthrow your defensive or offensive schematics, right? Um, I think that the, the NBA is in professional basketball in general is a little bit more um, initially generalized in that sense but then you're making those types of tweaks and those types of adjustments. And I think it's um, something that's really, really impressive. And one of the things that I learned the most about um, in my, in my couple of years in the league already is just not necessarily how great the coaches are at being able to make those adjustments so quickly, you know, some coaches have back-to-back -back scouts. So being able to make those types of adjustments, but how quickly the players are able to pick up on it. Sometimes you may not even get a chance to get on the court to practice. So it may be just watching 10 to 15 clips of film and talking through it. And then maybe it's a walk through in a ballroom before a game or walk through on your, on your floor before the game starts um, because there's not a lot of practice time in the NBA. So just the ability of guys to be able to retain information and then apply it in a game is really, really impressive. Uh, from a scouting uh, perspective, uh, we're lucky enough that we work with um, like fast model sports and things like that where a lot of like, um, analytical statistics and things like that are built into our, our scouting reports already. So there's a lot of data that we're provided um, that's updated on a nightly basis organically through the, through the, uh, through the website that we use. So um, it's, it's pretty analytically driven. Um, I have found over the last couple of years that um, a lot of teams run the same things. So you become pretty comfortable guarding familiar actions whether it's floppy horns whatever those actions may be so we spend a little bit more time on personnel based scouting right knowing guys tendencies um, whether they like to go left or right whether they can shoot off the dribble or not are you going under a screen are you going over a screen are you making them playmakers are you making them scores right so looking at analytic stuff that comes from those scouting reports and then we also have a full-time analytics guy who does a lot of that number stuff for us and crunches the numbers and and we get pregame reports that have a lot of that kind of stuff, lineup efficiencies, um, personal individualized numbers for each guys, um, things like that, that we'll get pregame and postgame along with our own stuff. So um, just being able to um, really dig into kind of personnel and how guys 
um, operate on the court and, and familiarize ourselves more personnel than overly schematic um, team-based concepts is, is a huge difference. Coach, quick question for you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Safet Castrack from Ryder University. Um, I heard someone that's been in the NBA for a while, Tim Gergerich, mentioned that you guys in the NBA value layups and uh, three-point shots and the mid-range is pretty much not valued at all. Um, like for us at the college level, if we have someone that's really good in the mid-range area, you know, we, we suggest them to shoot that shot, sure. um, especially if they can get to those spots at an efficient rate. Where are you with that and your mindset being on both sides? Yeah. Um, so I feel like in the last three or four years, analytics have really taken off in the game of basketball. So it wasn't necessarily a thing that I dealt with a lot at the college level. Um, but I can tell you that, especially here in Charlotte and even my time in Brooklyn, it's been very um, heavy in terms of analytics. So if you look at um, our shot profile this year in Charlotte, we were top 10 in the league in shot profile, which means that we took few mid range. We took um, a lot of shots at the rim and a lot of shots at three, like you said. Um, we've, we've given um, certain guys licenses to take good shots in the mid range based on what you're saying, right? So we will, we refer to it sometimes as their kill spots, right? Like if guys are shooting a high percentage um, near the dots or, or maybe one or two dribbles in, you know, they're going to have a little bit more leniency in taking those shots than what we're going to give other guys, right? Like the, the Devonte Grahams and the Terry Rogiers on our team, have a little bit more freedom to take those shots because they are higher caliber shooters off the bounce than maybe like a Miles Bridges would be. So um, I value the analytics of it, to be honest with you. Um, but I do, you know, there's, there's definitely rules and licenses that we have in Charlotte that allow guys the opportunity to shoot those mid range shots. Um, and it also does have a lot to do with who you're playing as well. You know, the teams like the Brooklyn's and the Walkies who, who keep their bigs back and coverages are inviting those shots more. So um, while those are opportunistic shots, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's something that we have to hammer into our guys that that's not always the best shot, right? So um, I think there's, there's room to have um, kind of a middle ground based on what your personnel is. However, um, if you were to ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm much more analytically inclined um, to, to shooting at the rim or shooting threes and, and you forgot the free throw line as well. That's something that we really emphasize and, um, prioritize here in Charlotte too is one of the best shots in the game is the free throw. So being able to get to the paint and uh, be able to get to the free throw line is something we value as well. Appreciate that coach. I'll ask a question. Uh, my name is Jonathan Finkel. What's the biggest adjustment you've had to make going from college to the NBA and what's kind of the biggest learning lessons you've had earlier in your career? Yeah. Um, well, if, if you wanted to talk strictly video, it's, it was a, it was a mind blowing experience being able to go from my understanding of what I thought I knew about sports code to being able to feel like I could write the program backwards right now in my head if I had to. So um, just the understanding of, of the different softwares that the video coordinators use and being able to proficiently use those and then being able to troubleshoot and um, be able to teach other assistants how to use it. And, and sometimes um, assistants don't always have the best workflow. So being able to work with them on, on what's the quickest and best way for them to be effective and, and, uh, and efficient in, in, their, in their daily work. So um, that's a big part of it. But from a coaching standpoint, um, obviously being a video coordinator and then doing the grad assistantship and ops in college, I haven't had a lot of like full-time assistant coaching um, opportunities. I've, I've been lucky over the last year or so to to be able to handle more player development stuff and have um, more of a of a uh, a role in that kind of stuff moving forward. But one thing I've noticed just from standing back and absorbing stuff is um, the coaching strategies that are used at the college level and the NBA level. And and this again is 100% my opinion. I could be completely wrong, but um, I feel like at the high school level and the college level, um, just from my experiences there, it's very much you know your players come in, you have your team, you have your roster, you sit down. All right this is how we're going to play. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to run. This is how we're going to guard, right? So it's, it's almost not hierarchical, but it's whatever the head coach or the assistant coach says goes. 
and you go with that every time. And there's a right and there's a wrong. You either did the, you did it correctly or you didn't based on what the coach wants. And I think something that I really have valued and, and taken at the NBA level is the back and forth and the camaraderie and the relationship that's built within the coaching, um, even game to game, right? Not even just on the court for player development workouts, but you know, uh, it's been a little bit different for us in Charlotte because we have such a young team. Um, but I know Coach uh, Pannone and even Coach Hardy will be able to talk about it probably a little bit more with, with working with veteran guys. There's a lot of times we're sitting in film sessions and Marvin Williams was great with us in Charlotte this year before we um, bought him out and sent him to Milwaukee. But he was really good about, you know, we may sit and film and we're guarding a pick and roll a certain way and we can't get to that coverage. We're struggling, whatever. And Marvin may speak up or our guys may speak up and be like, you know what, like, this is really difficult for us to do. Maybe instead of doing it this way, we should look at doing it this way. And there's no pride factor involved at all between our staff and our players, right? It's everybody working together to coming to an understanding. Because at the end of the day, it's not the coaches that are out there guarding the pick and roll, it's the players. So they need to be vocal. Um, and we value the fact that they have opinions in our scouting reports, in our schemes, and what we run offensively, all of that stuff. Um, runs through our players just as much as it does our head coach or our coaches. So um, just kind of that dialogue, being able to go back and forth with players um, and really work together to figure out what's the best and most effective way uh, for us to play on the offensive and defensive ends in order for us to be successful. And you'll also learn that when you allow players the empowerment of having a say in what they do, they tend to play a little bit harder and they tend to do it, right? Because it's their idea. If it's just everything that the head coach is saying, you know, they may not give the, all the effort because they may not believe in it. And I hear stories all the time um, about like Kyle Lowry and, and we had Tony Parker last year here in Charlotte. So just having those guys and listening to Tony talk about how um, the stuff in San Antonio used to go, just like the, the dialogue back and forth and, and just that kind, of, uh, that kind of method of coaching was extremely different um, and something that I've really bought into and I've really enjoyed seeing translate through my career. Does anyone else have any questions for Coach? Yeah, I do. Jordan, um, just to piggyback off what you just said, so if you got an opportunity to get a head coaching job in college, would you kind of take a little bit of that camaraderie that the players and the staff have in the NBA, just kind of getting some feedback from the players on what you can do defensively on different teams? Absolutely, and I think – I think it has to be dialed back a little bit in the college level, right? Or even at the high school level, because we're talking about um, veteran NBA guys who have been in the league eight, 10 years, right? As opposed to maybe a college freshman or a college sophomore. Um, I think at any level, regardless, right? L relationships are the biggest thing. Even if it has nothing to do directly with the game of basketball, if you don't have a type of relationship with your players where you can have a type of dialogue back and forth, I don't feel like you could ever really have success at any level because they've got to be able to trust you, right? They've got to know not only they have, that you have their best interest in mind, but the team's best interest in mind, as opposed to just sitting there and nailing what we're going to do every single day, right? So at any level, regardless, um, the, re the relationship aspect of it is extremely important. Uh, but I do think that you can take bits and pieces of what happens at the NBA level, right? And then put that into the college game or even the high school game. You know, you may not be asking your freshman, you know, point guard what he thinks is best. And maybe you will, you know, and I think it's a feel. It has to be a feel. You know, some guys come in naturally and just have that kind of understanding and that IQ, right? But it may be, all right, we have a little bit more trust in our fourth or fifth year seniors, right? They've been through the battles. They've, they've been in different situations before. So, so maybe you're valuing that a little bit more. Um, but I do think regardless, um, even if it's not necessarily directly scheme-wise, um, allowing your players to have a voice in film sessions is huge. Um, even if it's something that doesn't necessarily always translate directly to the court, right? But having like a respectful dialogue where you guys can have an understanding of um, this is how they feel. Um, this is what they're thinking. This is how their minds are working. And then that makes you a better coach, right? By understanding them and having that transparent relationship, now you're able to get into their head and see why they think that this is going on or right or why why he missed up this coverage all right well he's going to tell you why instead of just i don't know like if he tells you why now you can see what his thought process is 
And then that makes you a better coach moving forward because now you know how to kind of tweak the way you may be explaining it in practice um, or in walkthroughs or things like that. And every player is different. No one, no two people necessarily learn the same, right? Everybody has different learning strategies, whether it's um, just being able to hear something vocally and do it or something maybe visual, right? Some guys may need to see it on film. Other guys may just be able to hear it and be able to go out and do it, right? So being able to have those relationships on and off the court um, and those transparent, respectful, um, open dialogues with your players to whatever extent you think is best um, at your level, uh, I think is extremely important to, to help you as a coach overall. Thank you. Any last questions for Jordan before we let him go? All right. Well, Jordan, I appreciate you coming on, brother, and really good stuff you shared from a young NBA coach's perspective. And, you know, obviously I know, I know you've been in for a couple of years, and um, so I really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to these next two speakers as much as everybody else, so I'll probably hang out for a while. <laughs> no, absolutely. More than welcome. So next up, we will have uh, Coach Ryan Pannone, uh, head coach of the Erie Bayhawks, New Orleans Pelicans G League team. Um, Ryan's coached uh, overseas in um, Israel, Germany, Slovakia, China. Ryan, I'm probably forgetting about 12, but uh, hopefully I named at least a few of them. Uh, Ryan's uh, been a really um, – he's been probably one of the best coaches as far as to learn from in this quarantine time. Uh, so really excited to hear from him. So without further ado, uh, Coach Ryan Pannon. Thank you very much, uh, Coach Bentley, for having me. Um, <clears throat> Coach Bentley asked uh, to quickly go through our, our background, but really kind of share what, what you can't read uh, in a resume. And uh, obviously just looking on here, there's coaches uh, from all different levels, uh, at all different ages, at all different points of their career. And uh, for me, I started out uh, as a high school assistant coach at 18. I graduated from playing, and uh, I had some small college offers, uh, but I grew up poor, and my high school coach was my two best friends' dad, offered me uh, more money at 18 than what my mom had ever made. And uh, so I took that route working in the professional mortgage banking business and became his assistant coach for two years at the high school I played at, and then at 20, I uh, decided I wanted to do basketball full time. Uh, so I quit and uh, became a manager at South Florida and uh, became a head high school coach uh, at the high school where I was an assistant at. And so I became a head coach at the same year I was a manager in college for South Florida. And I started working for a guy by the name of David Thorpe, uh, who trained NBA players, uh, veteran players, players for the draft and uh was really one of the first uh, coaches to work with players full time uh, throughout the season. So this was back in 2005. And uh, that was uh, at 20 years old. And from 20 to 25, I, my goal was to be a combination of Bob Hurley and David Thorpe. Uh, after being a manager for a year, it was a less than positive experience for me. Uh, the way that uh, people were treated, uh, it, it wasn't for me. Uh, so I, I decided I just wanted to be a high school coach and, and train NBA players. And uh, doing that for five years, uh, I then left and took a JUCO assistant job at Wallace State uh, for a coach named John Meeks. And from there, uh, my wife really wanted to live abroad and, and travel the world. So I was fortunate enough to get a job offer in China at uh, 27, came back at 28 and worked with six NBA players full time throughout the season. Uh, Kevin Martin, Corey Brewer, uh, Omri Caspi, Gal Meckel, uh, Ed Davis and Nicolaitis. And that was kind of the first year where I wasn't a part of a team. And uh, I really missed being a part of a team. It's strange the things that you actually miss, the bus rides, the hotels, practices. And uh, I got an opportunity to 
be a G League assistant uh, for a coach by the name of Bill Peterson. And uh, then uh, I took uh, – my wife really wanted to live abroad, and, and I'd always kind of wanted to coach in Europe. She wanted to live in Europe uh, after coaching in Asia. And uh, I got offered a, a job in, in Germany and went from there to Israel and Hapol, Jerusalem, to a head coach in Pravica in Slovakia, back to Hapol, Jerusalem. Meanwhile, in between that, spending time in South Korea. And then I got the, the G League head coaching job for the Erie Bayhawks. And I would say what, what you don't see in the resume is this. Uh, from 18 to 25, I didn't get paid uh, from the high school that I coached at. I made my money by training players and work with NBA players. At 26, I took a JUCO job for $700 a month, no housing, no car. I had to move away from my wife, uh, who continued to teach at the high school that I coached at. Uh, I left and went to China and spent a few months away from my wife, which was for the first time good money. I got that job by finding every American coach I coached overseas uh, that I could on Facebook, sending them a message and only one coach responded. And I was fortunate enough that he saw some of the workouts that we did at IMG Academy, and he was looking for a player development minded coach. Came back, worked with the NBA players full time, had another good year making money, was offered a job in the G League as an assistant for $1,200 a month. Uh, no housing, no insurance, no nothing. It's for six months. And uh, had to move away from my wife. She, we couldn't afford to live. So she actually moved to Alabama to teach at the junior college that I was coaching at Wallace State. And uh, I moved uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania. I had to have a roommate and we could only afford, afford an apartment that's now since been condemned. Uh, we couldn't afford to turn the heat on uh, with the money that we were making. And from there, I got offered the job in Germany, which was for 700 bucks a month at 30 years old and married. From there, I got offered the job in Hopol, Jerusalem. Uh, but in order to take that job, I basically had to go for what would be $2,000 a month. But for anyone that's familiar with Israel, that's nothing because the cost of living is kind of extremely high, like New York. And uh, I took a head coaching job where I was owed five months salary uh, after 10 months. And then I was offered to come back to Hapol, Jerusalem, uh, where very fortunately they were pleased with my work the first time and uh, they you know, paid me a lot more money. And then I got the G League head coaching job. And so I, I think oftentimes as there's coaches from all different levels here, we look at someone's path and resume. And I, I spent a tremendous amount of time studying every coach that's in the NBA, what their path is to how they got there, because that was my goal was to, and is my goal is to become an NBA assistant. And when I broke it down for how coaches got to the NBA, if you weren't a former player, uh, if you weren't related or somebody's mailman, and then you came up through an intern or in the video room and, uh, now, obviously, the way to, to break in is also being an NBA G League head coach. And so if, if you break down and you study what the career path is to, to get where you want to go, my career path is a little bit unique and different. And for me, I think what, you, what we oftentimes don't see on a resume, right, is I think so many coaches at a, at a certain point in their career say they can't afford to do something. And what I've always tried to do is chase opportunity, not money. I've tried to build my resume uh, where when you send your resume someplace and apply for a job, it doesn't tell you how much money you made. And people just look at what you've done, where you've been, what your experience is. And I think a lot of coaches make the mistake of, of having the mentality of, I can't afford to do that. I've had to sell my car, personal belongings, whatever it is to to make ends meet. And I think if there's a will, there's a way for you to accomplish what your dream is. Uh, for me, I think coaching in Europe, uh, in my background, spending five years coaching professionally abroad, 
is a far different path than the majority of people that you see now in the NBA and for the majority of people that are on here. Uh, now you're seeing a few more coaches that, that have had that path, uh, but were far more successful at that path than me, such as Chris Finch, who's the associate head coach for the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, you know, he's one of, there's a few American coaches that, that have coached internationally that are in the NBA. And so I think trying to figure out how you break in, how you get that path and what your path is to what you want to accomplish is different. And for me, uh, starting out taking that path uh, was a great experience to live abroad and to coach abroad. And I think as you're, you're seeing people when you're, when you're in Europe, you're out of South, you're out of mind. People don't, they don't understand international basketball. They don't understand the quality of it. They don't understand the quality of coaching uh, that you see there. And I think some of the things that I've taken away is as we found out in the NBA, right? The, the best players in the world aren't just American players. And uh, as obviously as, as we're seeing consistently throughout the NBA, uh, there are great players all over the world. And as I have found and been able to experience, there are great coaches all over the world and at all different levels. And I think for different coaches that are on here at different points in their career and at different parts, uh, at different levels of their career, you know, I think it's important to know that, you know, a level doesn't define the quality of coach that you are. The theory that the best coaches are at the highest level uh, is a myth. You know, that, that's, that's not accurate. There are coaches at the Division three level that can coach guys at the Division one level under the table. And there are guys in Europe that can coach guys at the Division one level and the NBA level under the table and vice versa. You know, there's great coaches at, at every level. And I think as, as I've been able to see with uh, my experience and my travels, you know, I think uh, for coaches that, that are here to continue to study the game and chase being great at your craft and expanding your craft. It's interesting, right, as, as basketball is becoming more compartmentalized, uh, more like football to where this guy's an offensive coordinator, this guy's a defensive coordinator, this guy's a player development guy, this guy works with bigs, this guy works with guards. It's something uh, that I, I think coaches have got to continue to strive to be well-rounded uh, because otherwise you're limiting. And I don't know how you can understand offense without an understanding of how defense is going to guard it and vice versa. And I think coaches are oftentimes limited by saying, well, I, you know, I work with the bigs, you know, and, and you know, I, I think all of that is limiting to where continuing to try to study and grow in all aspects of the game is extremely important and then trying to implement it. I think some of the best things that have happened to me in my career, uh, number one, were being a head coach. Uh, I think being a head coach at any level is very valuable at any time uh, because there are a lot of coaches that get a head coaching job for the first time and they've never really held a board in their hand in a pressure situation to be able to draw up a play, an ATO, et cetera. And at the end of the day, as, as we all know, Players are not stupid. They know who's for them. They know who's not. They know who's prepared as a coach. They know who's not. They know who is ready for the challenge and who's not. And when oftentimes people talk about buy-in, uh, I've been on all sides of it. I've worked with players individually. I've worked uh, with players as a team and, and been a head coach where players have their individual trainer. And I've had times where I've been the individual trainer and it's been from high school, college, briefly uh, to the pro level, to the international game and things I've learned along the way that I think are extremely important. And the background of my entire coaching philosophy is the more you love the person, the harder you can coach the player. Uh, the theory that, 
being a former player uh, or not being a former player, color, race, religion, uh, none of that has anything to do with coaching. You are either good, you can either create buy-in, you're either prepared or you're not. Some of those things give you an advantage uh, in the beginning. You know, for me, uh, I've got different friends on here. You know, I was 55 pounds heavier than what I am now. You know, so at one point, I was a six-foot non-former player uh, that was fat and overweight. And to create buy-in from players that make millions of dollars, uh, at first, right, you're not going to pass a look test. I'm the bald fat guy. Uh, but quickly, what players find out is, number one, are you invested in them? And so for me, I had a never say no policy. I mean, any time a player wanted to work, I never said no. Uh, there's been countless nights where I've left movies, dinners with my wife. Didn't matter. Uh, in the middle of it, you know, my wife knew and understood to where I was always going to be available. And when the players knew that I was invested in them and their career, then I was prepared with the breakdowns and studies uh, that I've done on each player, right? It, all they care about is can you make them better? And, you know, on our G League staff, uh, which to be fair, we were not very good. We were 13 and 30. Uh, we have, we had between our strength coach, athletic trainer, our assistant coaches, we had two Asians, uh, three African Amer four African Americans, and and two Caucasians. Uh, and we had two females uh, that had played the game or didn't play the game. And I can say, it, you know, at all levels, all players care about is: Are you invested in them? Do you care about them as a person? Do you care about their success as a career? And can you make them better? That's it. And I think anything else goes out the window. And how you do that is, number one, really invest in them, getting to know them, uh, getting to know them as a person, their family, their background, how they were raised, what they value, what they like, uh, how to coach them, how to reach them. Every player, uh, how you reach one guy is, is different than the other. And not giving up on them. You know, I've, I've worked with NBA players that, you know, want to come back at night 10 out of 10 times. I've worked with guys that uh, if you never ask them to come back, they're not coming back zero out of 10. And so many coaches get frustrated when you ask that player to come back at night and they only come back five out of 10 times. And you feel like, ah, I care more about this guy than, than he does. Instead of having the mentality of, well, now he's working 50% more than what he would have. Right. And so I, I think continuing to be vulnerable with honesty of yourself and your players creates that buy in. And that's, you know, I've been fortunate where I've tried to do my whole career. Uh, and as a result, I got really lucky to be where I am today. Uh, when I got my G League head coaching job, uh, it was very nice. I received a lot of text messages from a lot of friends, some of the people that are on here, about how I deserve this, how I earn this, I sacrifice this, I grinded for this. And all of that is true, uh, except the deserving part. You know, for all of us, we're at some point in our career and we feel like we deserve something. We feel like, why does this coach uh, get this and I don't, how does he get this job and I don't, why is he here and I'm there, I have a better resume, I'm a better coach. When I got my G League head coaching job, uh, there are a lot of coaches that were available that were more qualified, more experienced, sacrificed just as much if not more, worked just as hard if not harder for longer and didn't get that job. One of those coaches was Connor Henry, who played in the NBA, coached in the NBA, scouted in the NBA, was a G League head coach, won a title, lost a title, was a G League assistant coach, set the record for wins. And he didn't get the job I did. You know, for whatever reason, I got very, very fortunate uh, that Trajan Langdon and David Griffin 
we're looking specifically for an American uh, coach with international coaching experience. And I got the job. And so I think all of us, uh, whether you're younger or older, including myself, have been at points of our career where we're frustrated with where we are and we're frustrated with why we aren't someplace else. And I would say uh, I've, I've got friends that are on this call and you know, there's been many times where they heard me bitch, well, why is this guy here and I'm not, uh, especially years ago. And one of the biggest things that helped me was realizing when I got hired in Hapol, Jerusalem, and, and people don't understand this, but it's a historical club in Europe. It was a team that Amari Stoudemire uh, was playing on. And uh, when I got hired there, there were a lot of coaches that were wondering, how did he get that job? Why is he there? I've got a better resume than him. He's a stupid American. He hasn't coached anywhere except second division Germany. I've been coaching in the Euro Cup, the Champions League, whatever. And wherever everyone is on this call, there are hundreds of people that want to be where you are. And I think that's one of the biggest things that, that helped me is there is always someone that's more qualified that is a better coach, more experience, has worked harder and longer than all of us that wants the job that we're in. And Jordan talked about it, about being great where you are, right? Being all in where your feet are. And, and obviously in, in this business, it's a relationship business of being hired, right? Like I try to tell young coaches, your network is your net worth. People hire who they know or somebody recommended by who they know. So you have to have that fine line of relationship building and networking while also being invested where you are and great where you are. And, you know, those are things that, that I've learned over the course of my career uh, that I thought have helped me and, and helped me grow and helped me become content and happy to be where I am and recognize that I'm very, very fortunate for every job that I have, including as a head coach in Slovakia, where I was owed five months salary, well, hey, there's a lot of dudes that were out of a job that would have been happy with just getting five months salary. You know, there's always someone that wants a job that we got. You know, so those are some of the things I've learned over the course of my career. We'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions for Coach Pannone. Obviously, if you have a question again, just jump in and introduce yourself. Dave, can I say something real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, Russ at Tennessee State. Uh, I've known Ryan for probably 15 years, and he wouldn't share this story, so I'm going to brag on him a little bit and share it for him. Um, and hopefully it can be a lesson to some young coaches on here. Um, I was an assistant coach about 10 years ago, and Ryan was trying to break in um, when he was a prep school coach. And and him and I would talk, and he, he, he literally left this one coach 50 voicemails. He called him every morning at 6 a.m. and left him 50 voicemails and could not get a phone call back. Couldn't get a phone call back. And I remember him and I having this conversation. And what Ryan did to build on a story, he talked about he, he went over to Europe and worked. But the thing that he did that, that a lot of people got to understand, the young people in this business, he, he found a way to create value. And he's become one of the best basketball minds, offensive minds at his age in the country. And everybody that's seen him on a Zoom knows he knows what he's talking about. He's very innovative. You can see it with his with his uh, Bayhawks G League team. But what he did is he took, you know, what he was saying, uh, you know, a roadblock, and he and he turned it into a blessing. He found a way to provide value. So that's 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 part of a story that he wouldn't share. Um, cause he is very humble, but I saw that and him and I had those conversations. So I thought that that would be valuable to other people on this call. The actual better part of that story is that coach told me, Hey, if I have an opening, you know, I think you should, I, whoever wants to apply for that job should wake up early and call every day so they can show that they're hungry for the job. And you know, after like three weeks straight of waking up at five 30 with that return phone call. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, for, for everyone on here, right, there's 
for whatever reason it is, you know, as I've tried to make my way and, and make my break, uh, there's been a, more people that are not helpful than are. Uh, more people that will not return a phone call, return an email than will. And at times it becomes discouraging. And, you know, as, as Russ said, right, we all get down, we all get discouraged, we all get frustrated uh, at some point in our career. And you can't, you know, uh, I tried to give myself a rule of, you know, when, when I would have a down day of basically I've got till the next morning to be a bitch about it. And then I got to wake up earlier and work harder and find a way to make myself better. And uh, it's something I, you know, I still try to do to this day. People made it their craft. Uh, you know, I'm 35. I'm very fortunate. I have two kids now. And uh, for me to continue to try to gain an edge because uh, if I can do everything, all over again, I would try to be an intern in the NBA. I, I didn't know about that at 33 years old. So the year before I got the G League head coaching job, I was actively trying to be an intern in the video room. Uh, only one team would consider hiring me. That was uh, Fred Hoiberg. Uh, and Gar Foreman said no. Fred Hoiberg wanted to hire me. Gar Foreman nixed it. So at 33, I was trying to basically work for Jordan. Uh, and then the next year, I got offered a G League head coaching job. You know, you you can't control when you get your break. You know, the, you can't control it. Some coaches get it at 24. Some coaches get it at 54. All you can do is work your ass off, study, be as good as you can at your craft, network, build authentic relationships, and be a good person. And that's the price of admission to be considered to get your break. You may never even get it. You may never get a break. Did we lose coach? Yeah. Oh my God, what do you mean? What's the head? Some Wi-Fi. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll give it a minute and see if he comes back on. All right, I think Coach Fanon might have had some computer or, or internet issues. So if he jumps back on, we'll uh, we'll kind of circle back to him at the end for, for some questions for him. Um, I hate that that happened because it was right in the middle of uh, the good stuff. So, um, but hopefully he'll be able to, to get back on with us. Um, but next up, we'll just go ahead and, and go ahead to, to Coach Will Hardy. Um, 
obviously Will's one of the top assistants in the NBA. Uh, had the, the fortune of working with one of the best organizations and, and Coach Greg Popovich. Um, here's Coach Panone right here. Let's see if he can get back on. Will, uh, Will, if you don't mind, I'll jump right back to him just for some questions. And then we'll uh, – Coach Panone, you back? Uh, hello. Coach, you there? Yeah, sorry, I'm at an Airbnb in Utah at the mountains, so now I'm walking outside. <laughs> no problem at all, Coach. Um, uh, but we were just going to turn over to, to questions, if that was all right with you. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Caleb, you had a question first. What's up, Coach? My name is Caleb Cooper. I'm an assistant at the West Town School. Um, uh, obviously, in, in college and NBA, the, the time that you're spending with your players is a little bit different. So what are some of the things that you're doing to uh, build those relationships that you talked about with your players so they do want to get that extra work with you in the gym and uh, get to know you better as a person other than the, the player-coach relationship? Uh, yeah, a few things. One, I, I think number one, uh, meals, right? I mean, as many meals as you can spend, obviously, at the college level, it's more in the calf on the campus. I think bus rides, anything that you can do in the bus rides as much individual film uh, that you can sit and connect and use with the player. Uh, I think connecting over uh, common things, you know, whatever it may be, and, and being vulnerable. You know, I spend a lot of time talking to our players. Uh, you know, an example over Christmas, you know, my sister tried to commit suicide. And uh, so that was what my Christmas day was this year. And being open and vulnerable with our players about that, you know, and speaking and being honest. Uh, you know, because everyone is going through something. And obviously, as we're seeing more and more as mental health is is becoming a bigger factor in the NBA, you know, I think speaking honest and being vulnerable about that with your players. Two, uh, anytime I feel like I fuck up in a game, the very first thing on the video edit on the post-game edit uh, is titled Stupid Fucking Coach. And uh, – you know, so I put as many of my mistakes in there in front of the players as possible to show honest vulnerability and uh, not afraid to admit when I was wrong, when I made a mistake, when I made the wrong play call, you know, drew up a bad play, bad ATO, whatever it is. Uh, you know, I try to always point the finger at myself in front of our players first. And, you know, I think having authentic conversations when you're with them that aren't basketball related, trying to figure out what's going on in, in their world, in their life. Uh, because obviously as players are getting older, whether they're 18 or 24 years old, there's some form of different problem, uh, which could be a problem that, you know, they're having within their family, with their mother, with their brother, with their sister, but then also learning how, some of them were raised and who their heroes are and why. And I think finding any way that you can connect authentically uh, with your players, because we all have something in common. You can throw away the race. You can throw away the religion. Uh, we all have something in common. And for some of that with players might be the desire to be great, the work ethic. For other players, it may be taste in music or movies or TV shows. Uh, you know, for another player we had named Josh Owens in uh, Hapol, Jerusalem, you know, we we connected over wanting to see the world. You know, he was, after the season, he would just take off and go visit Japan and all of these different countries and travel. So we would have different conversations about, like, where our dream is to go travel, what we want to do next, you know, the different dream spots on our list and why and so I think finding any compatible relationship with your players and for each player it's different you know oftentimes we try to use the same methods but every player is a locked door you know and you've got a key ring with a thousand keys on it you got to keep trying key after key to unlock each player and what unlocks one player doesn't unlock another I hope that answered your question. For sure. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it.
Any other questions? Coach Panona, I have a question for you. Kareem Brown here at Niagara County Community College. Um, how, I guess, I mean, you don't have to go into too, de too much detail, but how are those conversations that you had to have with your wife uh, regarding trying to keep that, that, that uh, balance between family and your career? Uh, you know, I, number one, I'm very fortunate that uh, my wife is a very independent woman. Uh, so, you know, she, she's independent, one, two, in her family of uh, six other siblings, plus her parents, everyone played basketball at some level. And then three, you know, I think what my wife uh, figured out was I wasn't going to strip clubs. I wasn't, you know, going out chasing women. I wasn't going out uh, to do anything. Everything I was doing was solely about becoming a better coach and advancing my career. You know, so I think when she saw it as uh, – me working as hard as I can to better our life in the future uh, uh, is, is what helped that. And then now that we have kids, now it's still trying to have the, the same work ethic uh, as you did before kids. And so what I had to do was just cut out all my hobbies. Like I used to love movies and TV shows. Now I've just tried to cut them out. You know, I try to cut out my life as my family and basketball you know, and there's no other hobby. I, I have never watched any other sports because I feel like anytime I'm watching another sport, I should be watching or study basketball. If I watch a TV show with my wife, I'd never watch it basically without cutting film or studying something. Um, you know, unfortunately she gets it that it's, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, as I say, it's not like I'm out golfing eight hours a day or, you know, out uh, at a strip club my wife knows that even at the final four the EuroLeague final four whatever event I go to for networking it's you know solely about business and relationship building thank you coach I'll ask one when you got your G League opportunity what went into you building your staff sure so I I'll go over what I what I think uh, is one of the biggest mistakes people make. Also, uh, so on our G League staff, two of the assistant coaches were hired before I was: Gravis Vasquez and Mary Andrade. Uh, we actually lost Gravis a week into the preseason because he he had to go to Italy and get surgery, and he was in Italy from November up until the epidemic. And uh, I had input on one spot on my staff. Uh, which we hired a coach by the name of TJ Saint. And uh, I think when, when people get a job, the very first thing that they do is they hire their friends, which I think is a mistake. Uh, I think that you should hire the person that is best qualified for the job that shows loyal traits. I think oftentimes we – we misunderstand what loyalty is, right? We think that somebody is loyal to you because they've known you for X amount of period of time, right? And uh, loyalty is a trait. When you first start dating a girl, just because you've only been dating her for two weeks, if you cheat on her or not, you're either a loyal person or not. You're either going to cheat or you're not. How long you knew that girl is irrelevant. You're either going to cheat in the first two weeks or the first month. You know, at what point, does loyalty establish with your spouse, with your husband or with your wife, right? Like it's, there's no time frame. It's a, it's a character trait. And so for me, uh, we hired TJ Saint, who I didn't really know. But what I did know was he was a better coach than me. And for me, I think you have to hire the people that are best qualified for the job that are going to make your players better and is going to make you better. And so I wanted to hire somebody. If you look at TJ Saints resume, if he was named the head coach of the Erie Bayhawks uh, and I was named his assistant, nobody would blink an eye. In reality, he should be the head coach of the Erie Bayhawks. Uh, and I should be his assistant based off his resume and experience alone. And so I wanted to hire somebody that I thought was smarter than me and that would push our players and our staff and literally uh, when we hired him, I told him his job is to make sure I don't get fired. 
that if he doesn't agree with what we're doing, say something. You know, don't sit there and agree with me if you don't agree with me. If you don't, if you think there's a better way, say it. If you think we could do something different, say it. I may not agree with you, but I'll listen with you. And he did that. And, you know, we had multiple discussions over many aspects of our team. And uh, he made me a better coach and he made our players uh, better players. And I think so many times, right, we, we hire our friends. We hire people that because they're our friends, we think they're going to be loyal to us. Uh, that aren't actually qualified for the job, that don't make the players better, doesn't make the team the best that it could be. It doesn't make us as, as good a coaches as we can be. And that's, you know, just kind of my mentality. I, like, I didn't – I had three or four phone calls with TJ Saint before I ever got the job. What I knew was he was a sharp, sharp, sharp dude, extremely well-prepared, had worked for Tom Crean, uh, had worked for Tom Crean, Stan Van Gundy, Brad Stevens, Rick Bird, and now me. Uh, he got fucked on that last one, huh? Uh, but I knew he was super prepared, and I knew he had a loyalty trait. Like, that's – loyalty is a trait. You don't have to know somebody for a long time to be loyal to them. And uh, he, he's amazing. You know, he's, he's very, very high level. Thanks, Coach. Does anyone else have any questions for Coach Pannone? I'll ask a question. Um, Coach Pannone, my name is Jonathan Finkel. Mine is more of an unrelated question to basketball, but more about your experiences, um, you know, overseas. You know, what's more some of the unique things as far as, you know, the players that are native to that, that country you're coaching in that you got to able – if you were able to go visit them in their house, you know, eat with their family or just go to family gatherings that you were able to experience and kind of bring back with you to – you know, help build a culture at the, the place you're at now? Yeah, sure. I So, number one, I, I think, and this is, once again, my opinion, and uh, it's it's solely my opinion and not in a way to rub anyone the wrong way. I, you know, I was raised uh, – I was raised by a white mother, white father, although we grew up poor. We grew up in uh, – I'm the only – person from my family to graduate college which I didn't do till I was 26 uh both of my sisters have been in and out of jail as long as a five-year stretch I'm the only male from my neighborhood at my age to graduate high school but yet I still grew up with a white mother white father and I was raised to believe that America is the greatest country in the world and the way that we do things is the best and what I found at 27 traveling to China uh, and as I spent my first few weeks in China wondering why, well, why don't they do it like this? This is how we do it in America. This is stupid. Uh, with the ignorance and arrogance uh, that uh, many Americans, especially white Americans, have about the rest of the world, I began to realize China is a much older country than we are. And there are many things in the Chinese culture that would make America great again. And if I think if you take a look at America as a whole, and this will tie into your question, right? America was raised on basically the different cultures that immigrants brought from different countries, uh, that immigrants brought from Poland, from Italy, from Israel, from China, from Africa, from all over the world uh, that became the melting pot that is America, that made America great in terms of you know, when I was younger, Sunday dinners were a big thing, right? Like you had Sunday dinner with your family, no matter what, where is that gone today? And what I found while coaching in Israel was right. They have Shabbat dinner Friday night. And so in Israel at three o'clock, everything shuts down uh, until Saturday night after seven. And so it didn't matter what I saw players that were three, four hours away from their family were driving that night to have Shabbat dinner with her, with her family. And so I got to experience Shabbat dinners there in China. The way that they treat their elderly is amazing, right? So like as the grandparents get older, they actually move in with their kids and then they raise the grandbabies. And so in, in each country and each culture, I got to learn different things that I thought made uh, their country and culture great. And then to try to, uh, involve that in our team makeup as part of understanding and part of understanding of 
where our players came from, how they were raised, what the culture was in their house, because the culture in each player's house was actually different. And then trying to connect with what their family culture and values were, because it, it doesn't matter how each of these players were raised. There was some culture in their house that was a stable for how that they were raised. And for some of them, right, it was, they had, uh, it was like dollar movies, uh, dollar movie with their mother uh, on Wednesday night. You know, and so that that was like their staple as a kid. They didn't have much money, but they could go to the dollar movie theater Wednesday night, right? And so I, I think learning, as I said before, about each player, how they were raised, what the culture was, what the foundation of how they were raised, who raised them, and what was important, and then building that into it. You know, for some of them, uh, family dinners were important. Like I tried to do as many uh, dinners with my wife and, and my family with our players as we could and tried to invite players over for, for dinners to build those personal relationships because we had a lot of rookies in the G League, but even internationally, we did that with the German players, the Slovakian players, and inviting them for our customs for Thanksgiving and the way that we did Christmas to then also learning right about the, the Chinese New Year or in uh, Israel, they've got literally holidays like every month. It's crazy. Uh, you know, so, so learning about those and, and then understanding and embracing the culture and then taking that to the players, embracing their culture and background and trying to, to learn more about it. If that answers your question. Ryan, uh, Domley at Halleckville University of South Dakota. Uh, thanks for coming out here and all the knowledge you've uh, spent, shared with us. That's really good. Uh, my question is, with all your different experiences, especially at the professional level, uh, what are some three um, key things that stand out to all the really good players that you've coached that they have in common that you would stress um, to kids in college if we were to go back to college? What separates those guys apart, especially the players overseas? Because a lot of our guys that don't play in the NBA end up playing overseas. What what can you talk about specifically about those players that separate them uh, that could help us college players? Number one, love basketball. And so that, that, that sounds like a joke, right? And so coming back to the G League this year, I would say that we had four players that love basketball, eight players that didn't. And, you know, I got to coach Amari Stoudemire. Okay, he was 34 years old. But that guy – loves basketball and to me loving basketball he wanted the scouting report he wanted the long extended version of the personnel that we watched as a coaching staff he wanted that he wanted to be coached throughout the game I mean every dumb shooting drill you would do it shoot around he'd be like all right let's go let's go let's go you know he like he just loves to play basketball you give him a basketball and a hoop and Amari Stoudemire is a happy camper and I think the best players I've been around, they love basketball from, okay, doesn't mean that they enjoy practice every day, but so many of these players that I had in the G League, they literally want to show up to the game and play. And no, I like it was crazy. Like it was suggested to me by one of our point guards, like let's not run any plays. Let's just play pickup basketball. One of our other point guards had about 20 times this year where he called the he had a play call that he called that we never had in our playbook. Like you just call something random. Uh, it was totally unique, you know, but like they don't want to do shoot around. They don't want to pay attention to the scatter report. And, you know, I think that's, that's part of it, right? Like if you love basketball, right, you embrace and you've got to learn to love practice. Cause in Europe you're practicing on most teams twice a day, and if you don't play in European competition five days a week, so you got to learn to love practice and embrace practice and love the work and love uh, the details of it. And so I would say they love basketball, they love the details, and they take care of their body. I mean, those guys are unbelievable, like the guys that are pros, pros of what they eat, how they take care of their body, the way that they diet throughout the season. I mean, those guys are super serious about every aspect of performing at the highest level. And that's been the same way of the, the NBA players. The better NBA players that had longer careers that I worked with outside of freak injuries were the same thing. You know, they just 
when they're in the season, man, they're, they're the best of the best. And I think we see it. We read about it all the time, right? Like guys like LeBron and Rondo and so many of these pros, you know, they know the other teams play. Like you, you'll see young rookies out there and, you know, Rondo will be like, hey, man, you, you got to go off the Sagger screen here. And then that guy will look at his assistant and be like, yeah, he's right. <laughs> like, you know, the, I mean, the, those guys, their IQ is – and their study and crave of knowledge is amazing. Right. Appreciate that. Coach Pannone, I feel like I'm trying to drink out of a fire hydrant with how much knowledge and, and journey you shared with us tonight. Um so I, I really appreciate you coming on and, um, you know, obviously we, we worked through the, uh, the drop and, and kept running. So it's part of the game. And uh, I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. No, thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone's time. And coach, I'm going to try to reconnect. So I, I may drop and then you have to re-add me again. Absolutely. I'm try to walk back inside and get back on Wi-Fi. Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll be happy to. So, thank well, uh, next up tonight, uh, I kind of introduced him a little earlier, but um, we'll have Will Hardy. Obviously, like I said, Will is one of the top assistants in the uh, in the NBA. Um, had the privilege of working for um, one of the best, if not the best, in the uh, in the NBA. And uh, want to give a, a thank you to uh, Joey Catapio at Lamar for introducing me to uh, Coach Hardy and uh, helping me get him on. So. Thanks, Coach Catapio, for that. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Will Hardy with the San Antonio Spurs. What's up, everybody? Uh, Coach Bentley, thanks for having me on. Joey, thanks for connecting us. Uh, first of all, fuck, I got to follow Ryan. Um, unbelievable stuff from him and Jordan. Um, so happy to be with you guys, coming to you live from the uh, the bubble down here in Orlando. Uh, I'm sure you guys are seeing some of that stuff on social media, but um you know everything down here is good everybody's safe players are healthy we're getting ready to start these scrimmages up this week so uh about 10 days till the game starts so everybody's getting itching for it um you know first of all i'm uh i'm the luckiest person on this call it's not even close um i played division three basketball i grew up in richmond virginia um played division three basketball at a small school in massachusetts um, and it's a, a very long story, longer than, than time we have. Um, but I was, I was lucky enough to land an internship in San Antonio, uh, working for the Spurs at, uh, at 22. Um, I went in eyes wide open. Um, it was a one year internship and, you know, I understood what I was walking into and I understood that I didn't know a fucking thing. Um, so I tried to approach every day the same way that I still try to approach it, which is, um, you know, like we're having a conversation here tonight, all of us, I don't know any more than any of you guys, um, basketball, coaching basketball is a moving target. Um, we're all trying to learn on the fly. Every situation is different. Every player that we coach is different. There's context to everything. Um, so I try to be comfortable with, I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I'll, I'll try to find out. Um, I'm comfortable with what I know and I'm comfortable with the fact that I don't know everything. Um, and that was kind of the, the mantra as an intern in San Antonio was, you know, when we showed up the first day, I remember being told by Dennis Lindsay, who's now the GM for the Utah Jazz. He was our assistant GM at the time. He walked right up to me and just looked me in the face and said, I want you to be seen, not heard done. You don't have to tell me twice. I don't think I said a word for a whole year. Um, just tried to do my job, whatever it was asked of me. I just tried to do my job. I tried to be consistent, um, with my, my attitude and my mood, right? We all have stuff going on at home. We all have stuff going on outside of work. Um, the seasons can be long wins, losses. Um, I just tried to be as consistent as I could. So I went through the first year, um, I was actually uh, an intern on our front office side, working for our GM, R.C. Buford. I just finished playing in college, so I was asked to be on the court in the mornings for uh, the player development workouts, basically as the punching bag, um, guarding guys, rebounding, 
um, you know, whatever was needed to help our player development staff, you know, with those workouts. So I came in in the morning and did that every day, was able to develop a relationship with some of the coaches and the players just through being around on the court. So at the end of that first year, um, I was offered a position in our video room, uh, move over to the video room and work for the coaches. And again, the mindset stayed the same. It was just whatever I was asked to do, I was going to do it. Um, you know, like all of us, right? We all make sacrifices, personal life, you know, event stuff with friends, family stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I did whatever I could, you know, for my job. And I was able to be in the video room for six years. Um, three of those years, I was the video coordinator, you know, along the way. Again, that's why I say I'm the luckiest guy on the call. I got lucky four times, um, some good timing some people above me leaving it kind of allowed me to grow organically within the organization um and just kind of keep moving up a little bit um each year taking on a little bit more responsibility each year um and again i, I just tried to do the best that i could with what i was given if this is my task i'm gonna, I'm gonna try to to excel at this task um you know i was able to, to forge a lot of good relationships along the way um, I've now been in San Antonio 10 years, uh, been an assistant coach for four, um, ran our player development program for three years. Uh, obviously the, the list of coaches that I've worked for and with is, is incredible to me. Um, obviously coach pop, Mike Budenholzer, Brett Brown, Jock Vaughn, um, Ime Udoka, James Borrego, you know, and these are all people that I've tried to learn a little bit from uh, along the way. You know, you kind of steal bits and pieces from everybody, right? Like we've all been influenced, all coaches, like my, my high school coach, my college coach, all these coaches that I've worked for, um, just continuing to try to learn and grow. Um, at the same time, I, I, again, I can't, I can't say it enough. Like I, I'm, I'm comfortable with what I don't know. I don't try to be a master of every field. I don't try to have all the answers. Um, again, it's a moving target. You know, there, there's a lot of you on this call that you may know more in a certain area than I do, and that's okay. Um, I'm continuing to try to learn. I'm continuing to try to, you know, support our players and, and our head coach, Coach Pop, um, being consistent every day there for them, be prepared. Um, and that's really, you know, the – the short story of, of where I am. Um, I'd like to make this a little bit more of a conversation. Um, I'm not much of a speech giver again, I, because I don't, I don't think that I know any more than any of you guys. Um, so if you guys have questions, I'd love to open this up and make it a little bit more of a conversation. If there's stuff particularly about me or my journey that you want to know about, I'm happy to share. Um, but but I really do believe that, you know, I'm, I still have a long way to go. I'm still learning a ton um, every day. I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to tweak things. I'm hard on myself. Um, you know, I think I fuck up all the time. Coach Pop tells me I fuck up all the time. So I, uh, I, I'm trying to continue to grow and get better as we go. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to work for great coaches. I've been fortunate to coach great players. Um, the fact that you know, Tim Duncan or Manu Ginobili would ever do anything I asked them to do just blows my mind. Um, and that speaks to the people that they are uh, being coachable. Um, I've learned as much from the players that I've coached as the coaches that I've coached for. Um, you know, like Ryan and Jordan both alluded to, you know, the players are smart. They, they know what's going on. They know what's possible and what's not possible. You know, they know what stuff just sounds good in a film session or looks good drawn on the board, but in the game, that's just, just fucking impossible. Um, so I, I've tried to learn from our players as much as the coaches, but I'd really like to make this, you know, I know I'm, I'm the last to go and you guys have heard a lot, so much great stuff. You know, Ryan's story is incredible. Um, Jordan works with a bunch of guys that I know in, in Charlotte and does a great job. So I just want to make this last part as much of a conversation as I can. Um, try to answer some questions and maybe have a little dialogue with some of you guys. Don't be bashful. 
Coach Hardy. What's up, man? Quick question for you. Uh, Safet Castro at Ryder University. With your upbringing, man, what are some things you did to gain that respect and build that rapport with, uh, you know, with the Manu Ginobili's and the Tim Duncans of the world? You know, because I just think that's something hard to do, man, and not a lot of people realize you got to get that buy-in before an X and or an O comes into play. Yeah, you know, again, I think it's some stuff that that both Ryan and Jordan alluded to. Um, you know, I just tried to be consistent, right? I tried to be there every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm there early, I'm there late. I'm I'm trying to do all that extra stuff. I'm trying to be consistent with my mood, my attitude, and again, I'm trying to be prepared. And that doesn't mean that I'm walking up to them every day saying, "Hey, you should do this," or "Hey, I was thinking about this." I didn't say shit, but there were three times a season, you know, when I'm young working in San Antonio. And Manu would come over at practice and say, hey, what does that guy shoot from three? The guy that I'm, you know, my matchup, what's he shoot from three? And if I knew, you gain a little bit of respect. Oh, he's prepared. He knows his shit. Um, so it wasn't me trying to push myself on them. It was more being consistent every day. They see that I'm there. They see that I'm working hard. And then be, trying to be as prepared as I could be for those moments when you were asked a question, those moments when – you were given an opportunity to speak. I've never tried to kind of beat down the door with, Hey, you know, I know this or I know that. And, and, and again, like I'm lucky as shit because I was already on the inside, so to speak. Like I'm there at practice. I'm there at the workouts. Like I have access to those guys. And so because of that, I just tried to make the most of that opportunity and not fuck it up. Um, I just wanted to be prepared and present. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Coach, uh, you mentioned a lot of great coaches that you've been able to learn and learn from and work with. As oftentimes players try to study other great players and steal and add to their game, what are some things that, that you've stolen from some of those coaches that, that any coach can really add to their uh, coaching game? Yeah, um, you know, it, it was a lot of different – little things from different coaches, right? Like, you know, Mike Budenholzer, he was the way that he could describe our offense to the players in a clean way. I tried to just like listen to him during walkthroughs and go to his station as much as I could at practice. Um, Etere Messina, who I love to death, one of the smartest, you know, offensive minds I've ever been around. You know, I, I tried to just kind of pick his brain on the offensive stuff. But I think with all those people, the thing that I learned is like, they're all looking at basketball through a little bit of a different lens. Um, Mike Budenholzer, super, super detailed. Brett Brown is a little bit more outside the box thinker. Um, And so I think all those people kind of challenged me to, to challenge myself to look at the game a little bit differently um, and not maybe so traditional all the time. Um, I think that's, you know, they kind of helped inform me different things to go study because I would listen to them and be like, oh, shit, that's a good point. Like, I don't know enough about that. Um, so I think they, they, for me, were a lot more of like a reference of areas that I could go explore. Um, and I, I just tried to, to listen as much as I could to all those different angles. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question perfectly, but, uh, you know, I just think there there's so many different lenses to look at the game through you know you you hear about the defensive coach the offensive coach the this and um all those different people have 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 kind of informed my experience in in different ways thank you yeah man appreciate your talk by the way man great great stuff coach this is sean tucker cambridge south Chester, and um cambridge maryland when the the pandemic initially hit and we're so used to routine and you got in the gym early and you would leave late <clears throat> when it first hit, what were some things that you did initially that, that, cause your routine had obviously changed. What are some things you did initially that, that you try to stay still engaged with the players and also engage with the coaches to keep things, you know, still moving along, so to speak. Yeah. The, the, the first thing we tried to do was really reach out to the players and just let them know that, you know, your door is always open kind of thing over the phone. Like I'm still here. 
just because you're not going to see me face to face every day, I'm still here. I'm still thinking about you. Um, because you know, we were all headed into this isolated space, um, for the coaches, you know, we tried to get on, on some meetings, you know, a couple times a week, just to, to discuss different areas kind of to review. We knew we were heading into, a a little bit of a break. Obviously it lasted longer than any of us in the country expected. Um, but it was a moment to kind of reflect. It was, Hey, okay, let's think about what we just have gone through these last 62 games. And let's think about some things that we want to look at, examine, you know, maybe try to, to brush up on. So, um, the first thing was just kind of like setting the table. So for the players, it was just trying to make sure that, hey, just because you're you're by yourself, we're still here. And for the coaches, it was, let's try to give some direction to these next couple of weeks. Um, and then obviously from there, as things kept getting pushed back and kept getting pushed back, there was a period of time as coaches where we didn't connect as much for a couple of weeks. We just kind of said, hey, take care of your families, be safe. Um, and we all kind of, you know, have – relationships with the players and reached out to them along the way. Um, but I think it was just kind of setting the table early on so we could kind of just organically keep things moving. I got a question. Uh, my name is Timothy Pete, Missouri Western State. What's up, man? It's me for all of the coaches. Uh, what are some, some of the habits that are hard, hard for you guys to break for college guys coming in um, so as college coaches, we try to get better at player development. Um, what are some things that, that are hard, some habits that, that you guys see constantly year in, year out? You other guys, you guys want to start? Ryan, Jordan, you guys want to start? Uh, I'll kind of give my thoughts. Uh, I think player development and skill development are two different things. I think oftentimes as coaches, we combine the two and confuse the two. Uh, skill development, right, is your ball handling, your shooting, your pick and roll reading, uh, your player development, and this is my own personal opinion, is more of uh, understanding offensive and defensive concepts, understanding the value of scouting report, et cetera. Um, I think from a skill development standpoint, I think one of the biggest things that is very undertaught in North American basketball as opposed to Europe is uh, the reading of pick and roll and understanding like we in Europe, the pick and roll is play to create the advantage, keep the advantage and use the advantage. In America at the youth age and college age, pick and roll is to create the advantage and use the advantage. There's no keep. And what do I mean is a lot of guards play pick and roll to shoot it or for the assist, uh, for the pass out of it to create the assist as opposed, right, once the advantage is created in Europe, they keep it by getting off it early, right, and, which allows someone else to then utilize that advantage. And so I think the real understanding and value of pick and roll play, because that's what the pro game has become at all levels from the G League to the NBA in Europe. You know, if, if you're a guard or if you're a big, you are playing. And, uh, and Coach, you have the exact number, I'm sure, of how many pick and rolls they run in the NBA. You know, we, we were trying to run in Europe, you know, close to 100 a night, you know, in, in Jerusalem. So I, I think that's one of the bigger things is really reading and understanding uh, at all of the various – uh, pick and roll coverage is what your reads are, right, and what the plays are, and then what the passes are out of those, and the little teaching points and setups that that uh, that go unnoticed probably at the college level. Jordan, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just picking backing off of uh, what Coach Panone said. I think the biggest thing that we see a lot is like the understanding of concepts and uh, spacing is a big thing. Obviously the court's different, uh, but just understanding um, how to play, you know, especially here in Charlotte where we have a really, really young team, you know, we emphasize uh, playing in concepts a lot and 80 to 90% of our practices on the offensive side of things will be under just playing organically and spacing and teaching guys how to play after the initial action breaks down. And that's something 
Um, especially at the college level, I do feel like a lot of, and even at the high school level, a lot of offenses are very, very structured in how you do things. And um, like, if you, if you look at a specific action, like horns, for instance, right? Like most teams know how to guard that initial action or the second side to that action, right? But it's what happens when that play breaks down um, and just teaching guys how to continue to keep the ball moving, uh, different reads, different actions out of, uh, like I said, just kind of the organic spacing um, and fluidity of offense after a play breaks down. And then another part, uh, not necessarily a habit, but something that, that you know, we've even seen here in Charlotte a little bit um, is, is the structure of a player's day. Uh, you know, at the NBA level, or you think about it in college, right? Like you have class, almost an entire day for a student athlete at the college or high school level is structured, right? You have study time at this time. You're going to eat around this time. You're going to lift at this time. At the NBA, the professional level, you have a lot of free time. And now guys are in the gym a lot. You're watching film. You're taking care of your body in the training room. You're lifting. But more times than not, those guys are in the gym at 9, 10 in the morning, and they're done by 12 or 1, right? So now it's what are they doing with the rest of their day um, that, that allows them to be prepared for whatever the next day is, whether it's a game or practice. So teaching guys really positive habits – um, and giving them an understanding of how to be successful off the court with their free time, whether it's making sure you're getting a good night's sleep, you're eating the right things, right? Because a lot of these kids coming out of college after one or two years are 19, 20 years old, and now they're seeing all this money that they'd never seen before, and now they have all this free time. So it's helping them to um, establish really good routines um, and really good habits off the court that, that help as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think Ryan and Jordan both made some really, really good points. Um, you know, and both of them really talked about like the team concept part, right? Like Ryan talking about the pick and roll reads and how that fits into a team concept, not necessarily just score for yourself or get an assist. Um, I think the thing I would say to piggyback on that, you know, players transitioning from college to the NBA, um, playing off the ball. You know, guys, I mean, we've had so many guys come in, they led their conference in scoring and they come to the team and it's like, yeah, dude, you're not getting any pick and rolls. Um, so you're going to have to learn how to play off the ball. Um, I think sometimes guys get focused on, you know, their 17 dribble combo move or, you know, something that looks good on Instagram. And then they come here and the, the efficiency with, you know, which they have to play to get, to get stuff done changes. Um, so I, th I think both these guys make great points on like fitting into a team concept is huge. Um, I feel like guys, guys are willing to work on their own game when it helps them. Um, but getting them to understand team concepts is a, uh, is a huge gap. Thank you. Hey, Coach, uh, Jonathan Finkel here. What's so up, man? what are the – what guys – you know, in the NBA you have so many different personnel people. I know you guys have Chip England on your staff, and I'm a big fan of what he does. Um, you know, what kind of guys like him have you been able to learn from um, in the industry? Working with guys like him, you know, he's been – he's one of the best player development guys, in my opinion, in the NBA. So um, what kind of guys – what guys – what kind of guys like him have you been able to learn from being in the NBA? Yeah, the, the two guys that um, have influenced me the most in that space are uh, Chip England and Chad Forcier. Chad's an assistant with the Bucks now. Um, he left us to go to Orlando with Frank Vogel and then was in uh, Memphis with J.B. Bickerstaff. And um, he's, he's worked under a guy, uh, you know, Tim Gergerich for years, um, has known Coach Gerg for years and um, both of those guys taught me so much in the player development space. Um, I think the thing, you know, again, Ryan alluded to this when, when he spoke, because uh, he obviously has experience working with a lot of, uh, you know, big time guys. The They opened my eyes so much to the psychological part of player development and working with players, right? Like we all see all this stuff all the time, like these really cool looking drills and there's like 19 cones and, two balls and then I'm going to throw a tennis ball at you. And like that stuff can help in certain spaces, but 
the psychology of players and working with players and helping them improve, um, you know, helping them be willing to change things that have, have been successful for them, right? Like guys that are walking in our door, fuck, they made it to the NBA. Like their way's been okay. It hasn't been terrible. They're in the NBA. So like to get those guys to change, there, there's a, a psychological element to it. Earning the trust, which, you know, was alluded to by both these guys that to, to get them to be willing to change. And I think both of them um, really influenced me in, in that space a lot. Um, and then simplifying things like the, the learning curve of, of people in anything, you know, you just, you can't learn a new language that fast. You can't break these habits that we all want it now, of course, but you know, chip, whether it's him working with guys on their shooting, um, Chad, all the great work he did with, with our guards, you know, on footwork and, and finishing and that type of stuff, building those habits, you know, you're having to, to strip back years of, you know, reps that these guys have done. And so sometimes you have to make it really, really simple in the beginning to try to get some traction with them. Um, you know, those two guys took a lot of time to, to teach me after hours, um, to teach me during practice, little nuggets, you know, ask them questions. And, you know, I'm really thankful for both those guys because obviously they're, they're both incredible at what they do. Um, and Chip, as you mentioned, is uh, he's one of a kind for sure. What's up, Coach Hardy? My name is Caleb Cooper. I'm an assistant at the Westtown School in uh, Pennsylvania. What's up, Caleb? Uh, I was doing a little research and I heard you uh, talk at Rising Coaches Conference about training your replacement and how you talked about Greg Popovich won't let you leave if you don't have someone to fulfill the same duties that you were doing at a high level. So what's one of the ways or some of the ways that you're continuing to do your job at a high level while still being able to train the person that might take your spot if you were to get an opportunity elsewhere? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it's it's what helped me in San Antonio is, is access, transparency. Um, you know, they, they let me be in film sessions. Um, there's pretty much an open door policy with the assistants that you work with. You know, Brett Brown, when I worked with him in the video room, I mean, I sat in his office like all day and almost watching him, uh, you know, go through his process and asking him questions and he'd ask me questions and just kind of starting to learn how he was getting to his answers, you know, how he was evaluating a team we were going to play and how he was trying to figure out what he was going to do for the game plan. Um, so I've tried to do that with, with any of the guys that, that work for us now, any of the video guys, when I was the video coordinator, um, Dutch Gailey, who is an assistant in Charlotte with Jordan, um, was our assistant and I let him run a bunch of stuff. I let him organize certain things. Um, now with our video guys, I mean, I try to be, you know, Ryan said he had a never say no policy. I try to have a never say no policy with our young coaches because I was one of those guys. Like I know for a fact, I'm not, I'm not anything without that same access from the coaches that I work for. So just taking the time to answer questions from people. Um, again, there's plenty of times that I tell, I, I don't necessarily have the perfect answer for you or, the perfect advice for you, but trying to give people, you know, the opportunity to ask questions, to have conversations. Um, because I know that that's how I learned was through that access to the, to the coaches that I worked for. Um, and I think it's, it's just, a, it's a daily thing, right? Some, there's just some days you're like, fuck, I don't want to answer any questions. I just want to do my work and I want to, you know, I got all this stuff going on, but um, there were so many coaches that, were and still are so good to me um, in moments that I'm sure they wanted to like swap me away like a fly. Um, so I, I just try to do the same with our guys. Hey coach, how are you? Uh, this is Sam Eversold, uh, division three, former division three basketball player at UW Oshkosh. So Glad to hear from another Division three player. Um, I, st I, know, I still hate Stevens Point, by the way. I still oh, hate Wisconsin yeah. Stevens Point. They fucking beat us in the national championship. 
I'm 32 years old and still had nightmares. Yeah, we uh, we hate that uh, that little drive right up to Stevens Point too. So okay, cool. I'm right there with We're you. Aligned on that. All right, cool. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so I know you kind of had a different little break in since you were just an intern, and then you kind of got right into uh, the organization. Um, but kind of speaking on those authentic relationships that Ryan hinted on earlier. Uh, so when you're trying to break into these authentic re- relationships, kind of outside of your organization itself. Um, do you use any tactics or kind of talk about maybe how you do add value to other people who, let's say, don't know you at all or maybe have a little bit of uh, interest in you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, I've um, I've been really lucky based on the access that I had early. Um, you know, I, I think the best advice I could give you is, is one, to, to be yourself, like, you know, however you, whatever your personality is, do it that way. Because people can sniff out the fake. Um, But you're going to have to stay on it. You know, Ryan talked about it. It it really, it sucks that there's a lot of people that, that won't respond, that won't give you a conversation, that won't answer questions. Um, And that's, that's really hard. Um, but I, what I would say to you is, you know, you have to just, you have to continue to, to try to find those, those areas of connection because, you know, like was said before, people hire and, and trust people that they know or people that are recommended from people that they know. Mm-hmm. And it, if you really start to think about it, there, there will be some, some connection that you have to somebody that. Um, can be enough to start a conversation. Um, maybe that won't give you access to everybody, but it gives you access to this guy and a develop a relationship with that person. Then one day it gives you access to somebody else. Um, so I, I would just tell you to, to try to find those areas of connection um, because it's, it's hard. It really is, man. Um, but when you get those opportunities, um, you know, Ryan, I'm going to keep going back to Ryan fucking guy's my hero. Now, um, the never say no, man. Like when I, whenever we're like summer league, stuff like that, somebody says, Hey, you want to grab a coffee? Yes. I want to grab a coffee. Yes. I want to, you know, jump on a call yet. Yeah, like I'm in it. And that's what you're doing here. Right. Like coach Bent is putting this stuff together and you're trying to make these connections and like, that's, that's, that's huge, man. Um, so I would just say, stay on it. Try to find those little areas of connection. Um, and don't get discouraged by the people that don't respond to you. Cause it's, it's one of the ugly parts of this business is that people just stop responding to people. Sure. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, man. Coach Hardy, uh, Donnelly, uh, Halibut, University of South Dakota. What's up, man? What's going on? Uh, you hear a lot of uh, talk about the Spurs culture. Uh, every coach, every college coach wants to, quote, unquote, emulate the Spurs culture and how they play. But our players obviously hate watching. They always think you're boring and, and whatnot. But uh, <laughs> uh, just talk about the culture. I mean, I've heard some stories because Cameron Hodge, who used to be a part of I think he might still be with the Spurs. Cam? Um, yeah. Uh, he's with Philly now. Ah, okay. Yeah, just, just went there this year. Philly. <laughs> just went there this year. Okay. Um, but, yeah, just maybe elaborate a little bit on the culture and, and what really separates the Spurs culture where it's well-known about how you guys operate. Talk a little bit about that and what goes into that and how it's cultivated to what it is now. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the any culture, the culture is the people. Um, I think Coach Pop, RC, as they've done this, they've always tried to pick the right person. Um, The right person, not the right player, not the right – it's the right person. Um, And sometimes they've made decisions and maybe taken a little bit less talent for the right person. Um, I think that's been such a big part uh, of the success. I think the other part of it is, like, the the culture itself it's it's lived every day like it's not just like words on a 
board or here are 11 pillars of success or, you know what I mean? Like where that looks good and that sounds good. But if you're not actually doing all those things every day, then your culture is nothing. Um, and so like, it's always just been about like being selfless, you know, coach pop says all the time, get over yourself. Like it ain't about you. Um, no one person is bigger than this. And, and that, that, that goes from him all the way down. Um, and I think there, there's a, a consistency of care, like caring for the, again, caring for the person, um, you know, every, every relationship, right? Like if you and I work together and you and I have no personal relationship at all, but we have a professional relationship. Well, if our professional relationship, one day we're disagreeing about something professionally, we have nothing to fall back on. Right. Um, so they try to engender these, these real relationships with people caring about your families, getting to know you, who you are. Um, so that in those moments where you're disagreeing professionally, well, I still know you're a good dude and you still know I'm a good dude and we're about the same things. Uh, and then there are those days that we could have a, a disagreement personally, but professionally we have a good relationship. And so we know how to come in and do our work because we're all working for the same goal. Um, you know, it, it's crazy because the culture gets talked about a lot. And I, I really just think it comes down to, we've had a lot of amazing people. Um, Coach Pop obviously being huge in that, but, but Tim Duncan, Manu, Tony, those guys, the way they went about their business every day, their willingness to be coached really set up everything. Um, because once you see the top dogs getting coached, once you see the top dogs working at the level of detail that they worked at, well, then all the other guys fall in line. Right. Because they're like, man, if Timmy's doing it like that, if Timmy's getting screamed at in the film session, shit, if Pop yells at me, I'm not going to get sensitive about it. It's not like he's picking favorites. Yeah. Um, and so it's really been about the people, man. Um, obviously, winning helps. Yeah. You know, Timmy and Manu and those guys were, they were that good. Right. Maybe even elaborate a little bit more about, you know, caring about the people and like maybe what type of things you guys are doing outside of the basketball court to help cultivate that culture. Like, is there specific things you guys doing? Is it just, yeah, I mean, you know, we all the time with the guys, like what are the, some of the things that, you know, that you're doing that's creating that culture? Cause you, you keep talking about, it's about the people and having good people, but. Right. So, you know, Ryan talked about dinner, right? Like dinner is a huge thing in our, in yeah. our organization. We try to have dinners with people. We try to do things with them outside of the building. When you're in the building, you're at work. Right. Go to lunch, go to dinner. Um, we do events like that. We try to get to know the, the guys and their backgrounds. And maybe some days they talk about something about where they're from. You know, Patty Mills has done some presentations uh, over the years about his history being an Aboriginal Australian um, and, and what that history really is. Um, yeah. Just kind of let himself be vulnerable in front of the team um, to let people get to know each other on a personal level. You know, we travel a ton during the season. Yeah. So we do events for the families while we're on the road uh -huh. to try to show a little support for them. You know, the, the wives, the, the families that are at home, while we're on the road, you know, they can kind of feel isolated. So sometimes if it's a long road trip, there's an event or a dinner or a something where they can get together and sort of feel connected to something. That's good. Um, so yes, some of those things that, you know, obviously it's the attention to off the court, right? Like right. on the court is almost easy when it comes to that stuff. For sure. Thanks. Yeah, man. I got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, fucking it, Joey. What do you want? How you doing, my man? Uh, in terms of, like, player development, who, at all the guys you've coached, who, who, who's probably the hardest working guy? And I guess, like, in the off season for a typical workout, like, how many shots are they getting up? How many oh. hours are they in the gym every day? Whew. Um, it, it would depend on the time of the year, but – I just kind of want to know so I can tell our guys. Yeah, I mean, the hardest working guy that I worked with 
in the summer, I'd say it's a tie between Patty Mills and Kawhi. Um, what well, like a typical workout with like Kawhi? How many, like how many hours a day is he going? You know, he he was going probably hour and a half on the floor after an hour and a half in the weight room. And I say that, and it sounds like it's not long enough, but if you go an hour and a half hard, like game speed, that's all you got. Like any guy who's like, I worked out for four hours today. It's like, come on, man. Like, what were you doing? How can you do that? Um, and again, I think with both of those guys, um, their attention to detail on every rep, like their uh, willingness to be coached on every rep, I think was special. Um, again, you know, I'd be interested to hear what, you know, Ryan or Jordan has to say on this. I, I think those guys, when you're doing it right and you're doing it hard, it, it doesn't last as long as you think. Um, obviously the summer you can go a little bit longer, but both of those guys were just so diligent about like the little details, um, whether it was, you know, their base on every jump shot or holding their, it's something as simple as like holding my follow through until it hits the rim on every shot in a summer. Um, I think both of those guys really just, it, it was how hard they worked out, but also like the mental aspect of it. Like they were, they were dug in on the details. Um, yeah, I'd say it's probably a tie between both those guys for me. Um, obviously, like Timmy, I didn't work with individually much. Um, you know, his work ethic was insane. You know, he'd go run, do a track workout, then do an hour and a half on the court, and then he'd go do Muay Thai for an hour. Um, so, you know, at, at this level, there's a lot of guys who who work hard, but those two for me, for sure. Yeah. I know you are talking earlier – about all the drills with 19 cones, tennis balls, and all that stuff. Like, I don't need you to go into full detail, but, like, what, what are some of the drills you would do with Kawhi? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of his stuff actually was, was pick and roll and shooting off the bounce um, when, when he worked with me because, I mean, Kawhi was a four in college. Um, and so playing on the perimeter, like, even if you watch him now, I love him. And he, I mean, God, he's, if not the best, he's got to be one of the top three players in the league. It doesn't look super smooth all the time. Like it's a little unnatural, but he gets to his spots and his footwork's super clean. And that's a credit to him. Like he put in a lot of work because playing on the perimeter that was not his life in college. That was not his life before the NBA. And, you know, he was lucky to, to be here where Tim, Tony, and Manu, where they were in their career when he was a rookie, that he wasn't just handed the ball and it was like, save us. Um, he got to kind of gradually build up to that. Um, so it was a lot of work that went into the pick and roll footwork and some of the reads and all that stuff to kind of get to that spot. And you said work pick and roll like him as a ball handler yeah him as a ball handler like setting his man up using his body um you know the timing of pick and roll all that stuff was just foreign to him because really in college he was the guy setting the screen yeah um and now here he is with the ball so um yeah, he, yeah. He, that's credit to him man he put in a lot of work a lot of hours on that stuff yeah and then i wanted to ask you like do you guys work on like coming not not a pick and roll situation like a down screen or something like for example like Steph Curry he's he's got the best defender on him every game it's probably hard as hell for him to get the ball but he probably works on using screens and being patient do you, do you guys work on that stuff a lot like cause with our team like our guys they get they get all excited and they'll run early um there won't be a good screen set. Um, I guess my question is like, do you guys work on stuff like that? Yeah, we do. Um, we do work on it. And because it, 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 it is a little unnatural for some guys playing off the ball. We're lucky because we have a couple guys who are really good at it. 
that we can use as examples. Patty being one and Marco Bellinelli is really, really good off the ball. So our young players, we try to put some of the young wings with those guys in some, in some drills. Um, but yeah, we're, we're having to work on that. Obviously, I mean, if I'm being honest with you, we've spent almost every day of this training camp here in Orlando, some point of practice is doing some shooting stuff off of, you know, walk away screens for some of our young players. Um, it's an area that, that we, we definitely have to work on a lot because all these guys are used to having the ball. Yeah. I got you. I appreciate you, Will. Yeah. I don't know if Ryan or, or uh, if either of them want to jump in um, on the, you know, the summer workout stuff. I'd be interested to hear what they have to say. Uh, I, I think I've been fortunate to work with different guys at different levels. Um, each guy is, is kind of unique, like Kevin Martin, uh, his season – you know, Will, you guys had him there for a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. His his season typically ended April 16th every year. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know, Kevin was a late first-round pick from a small college, uh, Western Carolina. And, uh, you know, n throughout the history of the NBA, nobody has had the increase of points per game from his rookie year to his fifth year. And, you know, Kevin is, is very – a self-made player. And so he was always in the gym by May 1st shooting. And so he would start out slow by May 1st. It was just coming there. Like he couldn't stay away from it. And, you know, he was sponsored by Jordan and, you know, Kevin had a rule like any flight when he had to go out to California for Jordan or anything else or any flight he had, he would work out before. And then he would take a red eye flight to be back uh, to come back and work out. And so I, th I just think his commitment to having an everyday mentality was a really high level. And uh, obviously from I, – I was fortunate enough to work with him for pretty much his whole career. His – you know, when he was a young player, his imagination and detail, like, you know, Kevin was top three in the NBA in generating fouls uh, and, and led the NBA in generating fouls even when Shaq was playing. And, like, he would jump in the air and fall on the floor on all finishes. And so, you know, like uh, Coach talked about, like, learn as much from your players. Like, his seeing not only his work ethic, but his imagination and then his detail uh, into what he was doing. Like, he would go up for a finish and fall on the floor to practice drawing the foul. And, you know, he had such a good imagination of his – it's not so popular in the NBA now, but – his mid post game, like he'd be generating contact and you hear, Oh, oh I got that foul. And he'd be selling with his body, but like his, his detail and imagination and what he was doing along with the attention to detail and his commitment to it. You know, I like, I, he was just an everyday guy. He was so consistent. You know, it wasn't, wasn't going to be like, I'm gonna work out these three days and go out to Vegas for four days and then come back to where other guys that I worked with, you know, they'd be there three, four days, go to Vegas, three days, come back and, uh, you know, Kevin went uh, pretty much every morning for about an hour and a half hard, lifted, and then he'd come back and shoot at night, uh, what we called low-impact shooting, to where I had to generate a bunch of different unique shooting drills that were time-based, field goal percentage-based to keep him entertained because you can't just, uh, I'm going to make 20 from five. Shit. Like, he gets bored. He's, he's so good. Uh, you know, as, as crazy as it sounds, because he partied hard, but he worked hard, Joe Kim Noah was a savage. Like, when he worked out, he went balls to the wall. And then, obviously, he'd go balls to the wall at night. But uh, during the workout, you know, he was he was always a one more guy. Like, if you said, okay, we're going to do six reps of this, you know, he would turn six into eight because he felt like he had to do that extra rep or two to outwork guys. And, and he'd yell it. You know, he'd be yelling like, you know, I'm a one more guy. I'm a one more guy. Uh, guys that aren't even in the NBA, like Gal Meckel, who played for the Mavs, you know, for a year and change is like, he's a freak. You know, he's like what, kind of like what coach talked about. Uh, he's one of the hardest workers I've been around just in everything he does. Like he shows up an hour early to the workout to stretch for the workout. Like he's, he's, he's got OCD. He's a freak, you know, and watching JJ Redick this year, uh, you know, at 36, 
I, I didn't get to work with him. I just watched him, uh, you know, his attention to detail, how hard he goes. You know, he'd show up and go for an hour at outright game speed and then practice and then shoot after, you know. I, I think those guys at, at that level, uh, like Coach said, there, so many of them work so hard in so many different ways. You know, I, I think how hard you work is can be at what speed you go, but it can also be the consistency at which you go at. And, you know, like Kevin Martin was every day, every summer, May 1st, he was in there, you know, and it's just, it's what he did. He, he felt awkward if he didn't have a ball in his hands. Like he just didn't feel right. And he'd come back at night and you get texts that, Hey, let's go shoot at 11 o'clock at night. You know, it's those guys, but their attention to detail and I think commitment to being great. You know, Kevin, we grooved his shot and changed some of the mechanics in his shot. And I think anytime you're doing that, that that involves real commitment to detail and being perfect. Uh, my coach said, holding your file through Lana with balance. And it was more about not a thousand reps, but, you know, 50 reps that were perfect. And that was kind of the mentality that we had. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off both of those guys. I mean, those are definitely great examples. Um, I was lucky enough uh, as an assistant video coordinator last year to work with Jay Hernandez, who um, is, is pretty prominent within the player development world. I uh, was able to help him and, and assist in a lot of like Kimba Walker's workouts. And Kimba's detail um, and his rise from from uh, where he was to, to being an all-star and all-league guy now is, is nothing short of – looking at the type of work ethic he had. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is just stuff to continue to piggyback off of what Coach Pannon and, and, and Coach Hardy said is, is just their attention to detail with Kimba being a, an undersized guard, right? Like his ability to get to the rim and still be able to finish um, was, was pretty miraculous. And a lot of it had to do with the work that Jay Hernandez did with him. But just his attention to detail, the footwork in the paint, the angles at which he could release a shot near the rim and the angles off the backboard and, and where you can place the ball on the glass and on the rim and just different things like that was, was huge. Um, and, and obviously his work ethic is second to none. And that's one of the reasons he is where he is now. But the one person that also sticks out to me um, was Marvin Williams and, and coach Gately um, worked with Marvin while he was here. Obviously he's in Milwaukee now, but he's been in the league since I think 2005, he's in his mid thirties and his, his ability to come in every day and still want to learn um, was really impressive. You see a lot of guys tailing off near the end of um, what they see as their careers, right? Just coming in and getting the reps in to get them in. And at that point they're, they're content with kind of what their role is and, and everything like that. But Marvin was, was always wanting to do more, always wanting to add to his bag, always wanting to um, continue to grow as a player. And his, uh, he's one of the truest pros I've ever had the opportunity to be around on the court and off. Always early to workouts, wanted to stay late, um, brought young guys with him along um, back at night. Doing that type of stuff was, was really impressive. But then just his detail um, from a shooting standpoint was something that really stuck out to me. He would go through a full, you know, 45 minute to an hour workout hard, right? And then he would have his routine that he did after every single workout and after every single practice where he would make anywhere from 250 to 300 made threes. And he had his routine of how many at each spot, um, but he would break it up into segments. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is he wouldn't always just count the makes that physically went in. He would only count the makes where it felt right and it was consistent. So he may have made 20 shots in one spot, but he may have only counted 12 of them because one of them was hit the left side of the rim and then went in and the next one hit the right side. And to him, that wasn't good enough. Like it wasn't consistent. Right. So um, just to continue to piggyback off what they're saying, like the level of consistency, um, the level of detail that these guys are willing to work at uh, Marv being able to shoot, you know, right foot planted left, you know, stepping in with the left foot and then left foot planted, stepping in with the right and then hopping to the right, hopping to the left all these different ways that you can get into a shot footwork wise, he tried to master all of them, you know? So um, just really, really impressive um, and really enjoyed my time being around those guys just because of that kind of stuff. Hey, how you doing, Will? Uh, I got a quick question. Uh, Adam Hood, uh, UTSA. What's up, man? Uh, hey, not much. How are you? Good. 
good. You're in the bubble. I'm in San Antonio. Live it, living a dream. Hundred, hundred and two today. You know. So, nice. <laughs> but no, I'm a big. Uh, again, a couple few people know I'm a big, big analytics guy. Uh, can you, can you kind of speak on? I mean, it's going to be a detailed question here, but you know, you guys have kind of shifted. You guys led the NBA in, in mid-range jumpers, uh, around 46 percent or so. And obviously, I know Lamarcus and Demar. You guys is two high usage guys, and you know, again, they they shoot. They're one and two at mid-range jumpers. Can you kind of speak on just kind of the shift? away from the threes and layups and, and, and just kind of speak on just the, 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 the shift in, in, in culture and the shift in just, I guess, shot selection. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, part of it is, um, you know, who are, who our top two scorers are and, and where they're comfortable. Um, I think this year we were obviously able to, to make a little bit of headway with LaMarcus. Um, he, uh, he, he started shooting some threes for us, which was nice, but, you know, it got to a point where, um, you know, it was going to be unproductive for us to ask, you know, like, Damar, you should shoot eight threes a game. Um, it was just based on how our roster was, was built. I know to the analytics world, um, that can be a little disappointing. Um, I argued with our analytics guys a lot this year. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's tough, right? Especially when you mm -hmm. have guys that, you know, DeMar's a four-time all-star. Yeah. Um, so to tell him to not shoot a mid-range jumper. And so we really just urge the rest of our team to hunt those shots. So, you know, if you take the top two scorers off of every NBA team, we were ninth in three-point attempts. Um, yeah. because that's just the way our team is built. Is it perfect? No, but that's where we're at. And um, it just seemed unnatural for us to try to strip away the identity of our two top players um, mm -hmm. where we felt like we were able to make the most headway with that was LaMarcus, um, you. you know, just get him to space. Hey, when you pick and pop instead of 18 feet, let's try to get that pop all the way to three. And to his credit, he did a good job of getting there. You know, early on, it wasn't getting him to shoot it. It was getting him to live with missing. Yeah. Um, it's easy to – I'm going to pop this. But when you're a naturally – you've been a two-point shooter your whole career, mm -hmm. and coach is like, you need to shoot more threes, you need to shoot more threes, and you shoot and you miss two threes in a row, your instinct on the third one is to creep in to where you're comfortable, even though the numbers may say that doesn't help. Yeah. Um, you know, it's – the psychology of a player just wanting to see one go in. Um, you know, we've all been there, whatever level you played at. Sometimes just seeing one go in gets you kind of back to level. So it was just based on our roster buildup. It wasn't uh, it wasn't like a directive or, hey, we're going to, you know, fuck this trend. We're going to just shoot mid-range jumpers <laughs> and we're not going to shoot threes. Um, so I hear you. I hear you. Um and I, I get it, but, uh, you know, sometimes with, with – especially with your top players that are that established, mm -hmm. it's really hard to just tell them don't shoot your favorite shot. Yeah. No, I got you. Yeah. No, I yeah. just – I just so was we, curious. We, just, I know. we tried to make it up with all the other guys best we could. I got you. No, I mean, just going off last year's numbers, you guys actually finished sixth in offensive efficiency because actually yeah. at half court, you know, I mean, it, a, a possession in the NBA actually is under a point per possession as it was last year. I haven't uh, crunched numbers for this season, but I know last season it was. So it actually kind of, you know, against analytics, you guys are actually working. So it's kind of weird, but keep doing your yeah. thing, keep winning. You know, <laughs> so uh, I know it, it's a crazy thing. I know it's the, you know, you're doubling yeah. down on the least efficient shot in basketball, but hey, you finished sixth in efficiency last year. So got to be something to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's the least efficient shot overall, but we have maybe the top two guys or top, yes. you know, two of the top 10 guys. At yes, that that's job. true. So for sure. Um, I know it doesn't feel good. If you like analytics, you probably hate watching us play. Uh, well, um, I mean, I, I've seen better you know, <laughs> examples, but no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, joking, I'm joking, but no, it's, it's all good. Yeah, man. I understand. Just curious. Yeah, I'd man. like to hear what your argument is against the analytics. Since you said you would always argue against it. I'd like to hear what that argument was on your end. Uh, my argument is the game isn't played in a spreadsheet. <laughs> and that the psychology of the guys, like, it all, it all sounds good. Like, no, just shoot another three. No, just shoot another three. But, like, when you're down 8-0 on the road 
hitting a pull up jumper to quiet the crowd, like that has a psychological effect. It's not just about the numbers. Um, I get the numbers. Believe me, I've I've had I've tried to have those guys educate me as much as possible, and it makes sense. Like the numbers make sense, but it's human beings playing the game, and there's there has to be some gray area in that, right? Like it doesn't feel good to just my my whole identity as a player is I just stand here and just bomb away threes. Um, Maybe with younger players, you can make that transition earlier and maybe you have a chance. But with guys that are as established as DeMar in L.A., I just think it's hard. Makes sense. Like it. Gabe not playing on the spreadsheet, I heard. <laughs> hey, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'll defer, man. Spurs, baby. That's, they they run the city, man. Oh, they you, run you the city. Good points. You have good points for sure. <laughs> no, I, I, it's all good. Hey, uh, Will, this is Randy Peel. How you doing? Hey, Randy. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, just want to thank everybody for uh, taking time to do this. I mean, it really means a lot. Um, I just wanted to, you know, run something by you, kind of like a, a, a quick, like, word association type thing. So, for example, we've talked a lot about pick and roll reads, right? So... My, my process is, um, okay, so the ball is being advanced. There's a middle third drag screen out of transition. So just in terms to kind of make sure, you know, thinking, you know, like, for example, the way you're thinking. So let's say first option, defender tries to fight over the top of the screen, mm -hmm. right? So would your time, I know Ryan, I thought I heard this recently, talked about a hostage dribble to put the defender on his back and then get separation. But, but if, the, if the defender is fighting over the top of the screen, like, you know, shortly, like what are you telling your offensive player in that situation? I mean, one, I think we're, we, we like it, especially with our team, if we can force guys over the top, because it gives us a chance to get the ball downhill. Um, you know, okay. we, we don't have, as Adam clearly knows, we don't have guards that are just uh, snipers from three off the bounce um, outside of like Patty Mills and, and Marco Bellinelli. So right, we're happy that the, if the guy goes over. Um, gotcha. You know, the concept of a hostage dribble, I think is good. I think there's, um, there's obviously – it depends on who the player is. Uh, you know, DeJounte Murray for us is a little bit more turn the corner with pace. Um, mm -hmm. He's not a big guy. Um, we've tried to work on some of that stuff, but it's just not his instinct. Um, right. You know, f for us, we're trying to get the big, if you can get the guy to go over the top to, to get out quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. We really struggle to guard pick and rolls where that big gets out with kind of like a free roll, um, mm -hmm. you know, Capella getting lobs obviously stands out to me with, with Houston. Um, but, but I think that that for us, get, just getting the guy to go over the top is huge um, in the middle, but we want our guards to try to put pressure on the bigs. Um, mm -hmm. the, the instinct to shoot that pull up um, can be easy for our team because that shot's kind of given to us. What would you do against a drop? A drop? Yeah, where the yeah, defender. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of times, we'll, we call it a cover, but an offensive guy's coming off the screen. The defender guarding the screener is staying in the same wood, right, as the ball and rim. But as the screener's rolling, the defender is basically having a hand on his tip. So uh, in a drop coverage, are you trying to do the same thing? Are you trying to attack, put pressure on that defender as well? Yeah, I mean, I think if the guy goes over the top and the bigs and drop, um, we'd like to try to get downhill and play two on one against the big. Um, our assumption against drop is that you're not going to get as much weak side help. So it, you're really dealing with the big more than anything. Um, I think that the drop is at least – 
the teams that are doing it the best, Milwaukee's obviously the best at it in the league. They're they're almost inviting that pull up, that long runner. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the best you can to get downhill to play two on one versus the big. Um, yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, uh, Ryan, you have any thoughts? I know um, this is an area that you're you're great in. Uh, yeah, I have a few thoughts. One, I mean, in, in terms of obviously when you're downhill, if you watch guys, uh, just in terms of the skill work standpoint, Joe Ingles is fantastic at utilizing the pass fake to the big to freeze uh, the drop defender and then go up and finish. Uh, Obviously, other guards like to use that wraparound finish late, I think, from an offensive tactic standpoint. Uh, re-screens are really hard to guard because any time that you have the re-screen and the big has now got to – ideally, I think, if you're playing a perfect drop like Milwaukee does, uh, right, you're, you're mm -hmm. splitting the guard and the big, right? You're playing the cat yep. and mouse game. And so now if you have that, that real hard rescreen where the guard comes off a little bit towards the elbow and he pops back and the big rescreens it. Now that big has got to adjust to the opposite side. And so to be able to perfectly split off a 50 50 rescreen in a drop, typically a big is going to, uh, he's going to shade one way or another. He's going to shade to, to the bigger the roller. Two, I think anything that becomes multiple pick and rolls. So if you play a middle pick and roll, uh, and you hit a big off a short roll and you flow into a, a side pick and roll that now is below the 45 free throw line extended. Mm -hmm. If you watch, uh, <clears throat> if you watch in, in my, cause that's something I've tried to obsess myself with on how to attack the drop. And so what I've found, uh, I don't have the numbers behind it. It's just what I found that, uh, a high pick and roll to a side pick and roll where a five has got to defend both. Typically on that side pick and roll, he's going to shade the ball handler, right? Because if you take a look, right, let's just say he's on this side of the floor. Now he's, you know, I'd have to draw it up. Let me get a board. But uh, he's going to shade the ball handler when it gets to the side pick and roll. And uh, so which opens up a lot of that pocket pass on that deep, empty corner pick and roll. And so I'll try to – Draw this up real quick on my board on what I'm saying. Uh, Brought the board to the Airbnb. That's awesome. <laughs> Always. I, I'm a professional. I have it with me at all times. <laughs> that way I can screw around on the uh, uh, on the airplane. So let's just say you have your five, one, two, right? So when he sets this screen uh, and he's coming off, is that clear? Right, so an X5 is going to be splitting, and you can hit that short roll to where now he's catching and he's going immediately to this side, and it's below the free throw line extended. So when you play here as this guy's coming up to the break, when you set that screen, because the five has now got to run from here to this side, he typically shades the ball handler, which opens up this uh, drop pass here. Right, so now when you're playing the second side, the five man is typically not split 50 50, right? He's going to be X five is going to shade the ball hammer. So now when he's coming off and it's deep inside the elbow, that pocket pass to a five man is, is wide open. I'm trying to hold it on my phone. I know I keep screwing it up. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And the other, th the other thing that I've found, right, is anything that comes from a deep empty corner step up, Mm -hmm. So anything that's below the free throw line, that's an empty corner step up and in the NBA and will actually, I can't say in the NBA because I've never coached in the NBA, but the Pelican solution was for empty corner step ups was to blitz it. Uh, will, what do you guys do on empty corner step ups? We, we just, we run our normal coverage. I would say 75% of the league, 50% of the league is going to blitz if you do a step up. Right. So, so simple solution to that, right? You just run a delay screen. So five, X five, two sets this screen. So now he's a delay, you force him to be in a drop, you know, mm -hmm. so, and then two just clears out to the other side. So that way you take away the hedge. We call it a delay screen, you know, solely to delay the, the five defender, but anything, whether it's a step up DHO that's coming this way below the free throw line extended, 
where this guy can get downhill, same thing, X5 shades to the ball handler, which mm -hmm. now when he's attacking rim like this, right, you're stressing and stretching this corner defender. So, like, let's just say if this is three, he's got to really make this choice of is he going to help on the roll and open up that, that drift, right, or is it going to be a drop pass for a dunk? And I think it's really effective depending on the skill of your players to run it on the left side of the floor so when X5 catches it on this pocket pass, it's a right-handed dunk, you know, this way. And it's got to be below free throw line extended because if it's above the free throw line extended, the low man doesn't has to rotate less, right? So like here at this point, he now has to rotate one step further as opposed to if you play it free throw line extended, the roll is going directly into the low man, if that makes sense. Yep, yep. So I think utilizing step up DHOs, like throwing it into the post, right? And then having that guy, same thing, come out or utilizing delay screens into a deep empty corner step up below the 45 is a great way to attack the drop conceptually. And uh, but making fives guard two pick and rolls in a row, I, what I found is even a guy that's a really good drop defender, they play really good drop defense on the first screen, right? So let's say they're 100% perfect on the first screen. On a re-screen or on a, a mid pick and roll to a side pick and roll, they're not 100%. That's, that's where the defense begins to crack. Mm -hmm. Great point. And I sell that without ever coaching in the NBA. So I, I, I can only tell you in, in, you know, in the places I've coached, but I really tried to spend a lot of time studying, obsessing on how to best attack the drop defense. And the other thing that I found, right, the, I did a breakdown in a clinic of it as, as coach said, Milwaukee's the best drop pick and roll defense, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, the purpose of the drop is to, you know, to eliminate the, the kickouts, the off-ball screens, to eliminate the off-ball movement, you know, to force it to solve the pick and roll two-on-two and, two and to force a mid-range jumper. Well, what I have found is this, right? If, if defending on the ball for 24 seconds, in our case, 30 seconds in your case, getting a guy to, to defend on the ball for 24 seconds uh, – and pay attention to every little detail and compete at the highest level uh, is extremely hard. How is it off the ball? And so I did a clinic on this and I used Milwaukee as an example for teams that play against it. When you play a pick and roll like this, right, you've got X five now in the drop. Okay. He's going back, etc. This guy's going, if you wait till the second dribble one, two, once the ball has broken the paint and this guy fills behind, and this guy fills behind. There is a very good chance X2 or X3 is going to turn their head. And I did a clinic on it, show an example of how many times Milwaukee's off-ball defenders turn their head. And those two guys just don't move. They just stand there. And so if you get them to move on this fill-behind action, uh, which is a prominent, you know, it's very, very prominent in Europe, right? So now if two is filling behind, one is penetrating, even if X2 is a shade behind on this fill behind, you're generating a few things. One, the catch and shoot three. Two, the attack, the catch, stampede, right? He can now attack the catch, get downhill, or the swing, swing, right? Because X3 is typically going to be a step behind. Now the swing, swing to three to attack that catch on a closeout. Mm -hmm. So even though teams are in a drop, you know, I, I use Milwaukee because they're the best. Those two off-ball defenders, turn their head on the second dribble all the time and watch the ball. And they're susceptible to fill behinds and uh, attacking that concept, wow. which I can send to you if you want it, Coach Peel. Thank you very much. I can send you the breakdown. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask one last question. And this is, can go for everybody. Um, I know you guys aren't doing a lot of recruiting like we are at the college level. Uh, but I would be curious, outside of the obvious of length, athleticism, uh, and obviously you got to have some level of skill to play at the professional level, what are some key things um, that we can look at? I'm big into evaluating. I, I, here at South Dakota, we're not getting the elite to the elite athletes, so we got to kind of be strategic in how we go about recruiting. But what are some 
key things when we're evaluating players that we should look at that translate to the professional level outside the obvious of length and athleticism and, and stuff like that? You got to start, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the most basic answer you could have is probably shooting, right? I think shooting translates at every level. So um, just having a guy that, that can come off a screen, uh, wide pin down, shoot off the bounce, obviously that's easier said than done sometimes in the recruiting game. But um, just from a very fundamental basic standpoint, just shooting I think is something that translates at every level. can never have enough shooters on your roster, I feel like. Sure. Ryan, you want me to uh, go or you go ahead? Listen, man, you're the champ. You, you just tell us when to do what to do. And, you know, <laughs> you, want, you want me to go? You want to go? I mean, there's a reason why you I were closing care. the show. There's huh? a reason why you were closing the show, man. You're, you're the final act. You're the big Just because I got nowhere to go in the morning, man. I'm in the bubble. Only place I'm going to in the morning is Zion National Park. That's all I can tell you. I'm going to be hiking. I may go fish off the dock and catch the same eight fish everybody in the NBA <laughs> caught and then throw it back. Uh, I, I think one of the, the most – I mean, I just say this. I, I think skill and IQ is so undervalued at the college level. They're so focused on size and athleticism. And I say this after being in Europe, like skill and IQ wins. I mean, you know, athleticism and, and length and height, you know, there, there's something to be said for the guy that's undersized and finds a way to win, right? Like that's, that's a talent. When someone that's six foot finds a way to overachieve uh, and you're so worried about the guy that's six foot four, like that's a skill. Finding guys that over – achieve that have skill level that have IQ. Um, this is my own personal philosophy and guys that I signed in Europe. Like, you know, we get so focused on what a guy can't do instead of what he can, you know, like as a head coach in Slovakia, I had a six, nine, uh, four man that was like 180 pounds. And my GM just kept talking about, well, uh, teams are just going to attack him in the post. I was like, yeah, great. Yeah. I'll just trap the post. You know, I was like, he shoots 45 from three. You know, if we get him seven threes a game, he, you know, you can't trap him on the perimeter. And, you know, people get so focused on, on size and length and athleticism. And I think in the NBA, we've seen it case after case. Uh, in Europe, I got to see it all the time. Like, you can either play or you can't. Like, size is overly – it's important, but it's not the most important factor. And I think it's seen in, in guys that consistently uh, outperform guys with more height. And I think that's why all the time in the NCAA tournament, right, we see guys at these low major schools that are just dragging dudes at these high major schools because they got skill, they got IQ, they can think the game. And in Europe, they don't have the, the level of athletes uh, that we do. But, man, I t those guys are smart. You know, those guys are smart and they are skilled and they can come off a pick and roll and throw a weak handed pass one handed on a dime to the corner. You know, I mean, I, I think that stuff is so valuable. And obviously uh, I think it's undervalued at the, at the college level. And I say that from being a high school coach, you know, I had 30 kids go division one in five years and the amount of times be like, well, he's a little small or he's a little slow. It's like, it's irrelevant finds a way to get it done and uh that's just my my mentality yeah i i definitely agree with ryan on this the skill and iq part um i think the, the the physical measurables always get talked about and inevitably they end up being a moot point on most people um you know another thing that really stands out um for us obviously you know competitiveness right like who really loves basketball, who wants to win. That, that's huge um, and probably isn't talked about enough. I think that the last two that, that always jump out to me are like coachability. And what I mean by that is like, are you willing to change? Are you willing to do something 
that maybe you haven't done before to help the group? Like when I see, I hear about kids, you know, he went to three different high schools because, well, you know, maybe there's some crazy situation why he did it, but you hear these stories of like, oh, I didn't like the coach or he wasn't doing this that I wanted or whatever, like that type of shit, it ends up coming up at our level at some point. And um, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. Um, Lastly, um, and I think this is becoming like a cultural thing in the last three years with the players is durability. For sure. This fucking knickknack, um, the, 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 the area between injured and sore has been completely put together. And like, I'm sorry, man. Like it's an 82 game business. Like you, you want to go see the top guys like LeBron plays every night. Like the top guys, they're playing every single night. You think they feel good? You think right. like their body? Do you think their bodies have felt good in five years? Like right. no way. It's just, it's not that type of sport. And everybody, I mean, all we have young kids coming in now, and every day it's something. Right. My foot sore. My on my finger. Ah, you know. I mean, it's like, dude, shut up. Like right. play. <laughs> it it just it ain't gonna be that perfect, and it's. I don't know how you evaluate that in high school. Right. But durability is, is becoming, it's becoming a, a problem. Sure. Um, you know, pushing through like, no, you got to stop. There's load management. Now there's this, there's that. I mean, all those lines are getting blurred. Right. Um, I think basketball wise skill and IQ, but I think on the, the personal part of, of, of that conversation, I think the durability and the willingness to change, um, jump out. Gotcha. Now, the reason why I ask that, too, is because I see the trend in the league, especially the league. I feel like it's – I know everyone talks about the phenoms of, like, Kevin Durant being seven feet, and I don't know if he's legit seven feet, but being a guard. But I feel like the game is trending away from your traditional bigs where there's not many bigs anymore. So I feel like the league's, quote, unquote, getting smaller because there's more guards playing big positions because of just the whole trend of versatility. And so obviously like we have a kid on our team that 6'10 led uh, the country in three point field goal percentage. You know, does that stick out to you guys when you're looking at players, you know, I mean, 6'10 shoot the three, that's kind of the modern day game. So I'm just kind of curious to see how, what you he, he want to come to the Bayhawks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take him. Does he love basketball? He does love basketball. He lo- he loves the play. Six, six ten and can shoot is always good. I think right. the the thing with bigs too is like it's starting to become like can you do less better? Right. Like all the like all oh, the Kevin McHale post moves and all right. that stuff like that just isn't really happening anymore. Yeah. But like you know Ryan's drawing some of that stuff. Like can you catch the ball in the pocket right. and make right. a. Re- like, right. can you can you physically get the ball from one side of the court to the other and do a DHO and set a screen? Like, because the the big man transition is happening, right. but the good ones are really valuable. Right. Um, and so, like, I'm if you can but it sounds like it's a, it's becoming a, a one not necessarily one dimensional, but like, what's your greatest skill? Like, are you a great passer? Are you a great shooter? Are you a great finisher at the rim? The elite of the elites, I feel like, are the ones that have multiple skill sets. But uh... yeah, I mean, shooting shooting will help because you know there's some nights where you you want to space your big man because you want to pick on a matchup. Like, hey, we're going to run Kyle Corver's man into every pick and roll. We don't even care about the big. Um, and so your guy can stand in the corner and catch and shoot. Well, that helps. Like Lamarcus can do that for us. Um, but I think big men's roles are getting simplified. Right. And. Um, you know, I think it, it's changed some, right? Like the post move stuff is just over. For sure. Well, if you guys are interested, Tyler Hagenor, South Dakota, 6'10". <laughs> Erie Bayhawk. <laughs> He's an Erie Bayhawk. Future Erie Bayhawk. I'll, I'll throw it out there. Shot 54% Will. from three. Will, Pat Moynihan with App State. Uh, being with the Spurs for 10 years, I'm sure you're a wine kind of sore, so – one, let me get a let me get a good wine, and then uh, the second being, if you could take one or 
when you decide to move on, uh, what one quality are you taking from Coach Pop? Man. Um, shoot. Uh, the wine one's a tough one, I know. The wine one, uh, <laughs> man. I'll go A to Z. A to Z, Pinot Noir. You can find that in 80% of grocery stores. Very good uh, bang for your buck. Um, I'm going to say the one quality I'll take from Pop if I move on. Um, Shit. That's tough. Honesty. Like he's not afraid to be the bad guy. He'll tell guys the truth in uncomfortable situations. It doesn't sugarcoat it. Um, I think he, he always has very direct dialogue with the guys. They know where they stand. Um, it's easier said than done. But um, he's really, really honest with our team, with our staff. Um, so I, I'd hope that I could, I could be as much like him in that way. Um, I think we all sometimes we get caught up in like you, you're trying to tell the truth, but sometimes you don't want to like hurt a guy's feelings. Or um, some people don't like to be the bad guy. He has no problem being the bad guy. Um, and that's not being vindictive. That's just, this is the truth. Um, How do you guys have to go in behind and try and pick oh, them hell up? Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, um, that's a big part of our job is getting them back to, to level sometimes, especially because our, you know, we're playing four games a week. It's, there's not time to like wallow in it. Um, and so sometimes they're getting hard messages in a film session. We have a game that night. And so you're trying to, to get them back to level. Um, but that's, you know, the, the dynamic of any staff, right? Is like, you're all a little bit different. The personalities are different. If we were all like pop, we may have a problem. And if we were all, you know, happy, go lucky, it's all good. Well, then we have a problem too. Um, yeah, so I think honesty would be the one. Thanks. Great question. Thanks, man. Hey, um, Will, thank you so much for doing this. Can coach, and, and Ryan also. I'm, I'm curious, with so many young coaches on this call, can you speak to the value of having Becky Hammond on your staff? Because um, we obviously need more women coaching men. I've been married 21 years, and I would suck without my wife in my life. So – Speak to the value of that. I think it's something that a lot of men just don't even think of. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was really, really fortunate when Becky first came to work for us. We have assigned seats when we travel on the plane. And I sat next to her for two seasons on the plane. So got to spend a lot of time picking her brain and talking, you know, just conversationally. Um, you know, uh, the importance for me – is like you just find out like there's so much more that you're similar on than you're different on um you know some of the things that ryan touched on when he talked like the guys like within five minutes they know that one becky knows what she's fucking talking about two that she's tough and she ain't gonna take their shit and like three that she can help them and so like, boom, she's in like, no problem. Um, I think there's, there's obviously you focus on like people talk about, you know, stupid shit. That's like different. Like, Oh, I can't, Oh man. Well, you know, I got to watch what I say around Becky or I gotta, you know, it's like, well, dude, then maybe you got to think about one, what you're fucking saying. Like if you have to like <laughs> censor it to that degree, but you know, for me, like, it was just like, man, like she's a hooper. I'm a hooper, like all everybody on this call, like we're all junkies, man. Like, and she's just one of us. You know what I mean? She loves it, lives it, breathes it. So um, it's really important. You know, I think it's been, it's been great for our staff um, in so many ways. Um, 
but I think that she, she comes, she comes at it just like she's a, I'm a coach, right? Like I'm a, I'm a basketball player. That's her identity being a basketball player. It's not, I'm a woman coach or if I'm not a female coach coaching men, I'm just a basketball coach. Um, and I think the the more that it happens, you know, hopefully we can get that line just kind of blurred, like where it doesn't matter anymore. Um, yeah, she gets dressed in a different locker room, but that's besides that, like there really isn't any difference. Um, so she's been, she's been really good for our staff, but you know, like Ryan said earlier, I mean, it took five minutes for her to get the players respect. Like she's sharp. She's a good communicator, high care factor, and she's tough. And they're like, she can help us. Like, cool. I'll listen to any, you know, they'll listen to anybody that can help them. Thank you. Yeah, man. And she's from South Dakota. And she's from South Dakota. <laughs> well, shoot, does anyone have any last questions? Time got away from us. Didn't even realize we've been going for for close to three, but uh, this has been really good. Does anyone have any last questions before we call it a night? No. Jordan, Coach Fanone, Coach Hardy, uh, thank you guys, all three of you, for being on. This was, again, really, really good, really insightful to, you know, kind of get a glimpse into the pro game. So, obviously, I really thank uh, all three of you for, for giving up time and, um, you know, Jordan studying film, Ryan on his tour of the national parks, and Will throwing a jig tomorrow. Uh, you know, I, I know you guys, so I appreciate you guys giving up your time tonight to uh to share with us so really thank you for that appreciate you thank man. you yep. thanks, thanks guys thank you guys appreciate it